Hello, everyone. This is Scotty White of World Combat Sports. Thank you for turning up and tuning in. I thought I'd come on here and um, speak about the recent incident that just taken the news that just broke um, over the airways about boxer Maxim Dadashev, 13 and 1. Um, he contended on a televised fight, which everybody who watches boxing pretty much tuned in to. Uh, he was a super lightweight. He was in there um, with Subriel Matthias. And um, for those individuals who seen the fight, um, you can pretty much, you know, assess that over time, you know, from the mid rounds to the late, his condition started to degrade, you know, from the punishment he was taking from Matthias. Um, you know, first and foremost, I just want to, you know, um, send out those wishes and prayers to his family, you know, because I want to give a little backstory about um, Dada Chef. You know, he was a Russian fighter over here trying to make a living, you know, just trying to earn his green card and everything, competing in one of the toughest sports in the business. And like I always say about boxing, right, it's one of those gateways that you can undertake to make a living, but you're going to go through the rigors that demand you to um you know understand how tough the sport truly is it has a lot of adversity that comes with the sport of boxing um it really doesn't have a template anyone from all walks of life can compete in the sport and dada chef was a fighter over here trying to make a living for his family he was hoping to get a green card by competing over here in the sport of boxing unfortunately you know, this fighter, like so many um, who come over here, he wasn't able to complete that dream of his, especially coming from a neighboring country. You know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of dreams that went into that. I'm pretty sure, you know, he spoke it over with his wife and it was just one of those trips that they had been through before the routine and everything. Hey, hold on for a second. I'm, I'm going to drop this. I need to drop this link. Hold on for a second. Those of you that's tuned in, you know, let me know you're in the building. I'm just dropping this link right quick. It was storming over here, man. So it took a while for me to get on here. It kept shutting down. So like I was saying, um, this past Friday, you know, 13 and one Maxim Dada Chef, um, a fighter, Buddy McGirt, who, you know, when you saw the replays and everything online, you know, Buddy McGirt was pleading with this guy to stop the fight because he was taking too much punishment. And he did everything possible to convince this fighter who was willing to fight on even though he was probably feeling like crap, you know, he was feeling punished. He was feeling like he was on his last, last end of his energy and wits. You know what I'm saying? But when you have the adrenaline going and everything and you in there contending, guess what? You're, you're doing what you know that comes natural to the fight game. You know what I'm saying? You, you buckle up, you buckle down, so to speak, and you, you bite your mouthpiece and you keep, you keep going. And Buddy McGirt was pleading with his fighter that he was taking too much punishment after 11. Say, hey, I, I want to stop the fight. I want to stop the fight. And I'm not sure if, if it was his, um, the other trainer that was just standing there. But Buddy had to say, okay, let's be honest with me. You know, be honest with him. 
He's taking too much punishment. It doesn't matter where the fight was at at the time. From his assessment, it didn't, it wasn't able to move forward because every little moment, sometimes in these fights, it only takes a little bit more time for somebody to lose their life, you know, because we really don't know how bad off unless we visibly see it. We don't know how bad off a, a boxer is, you know, when they take punishment. It's just all about what an experienced eye, you know, like Buddy McGirt and others can assess from the punishment from the first round until the time it will stop. If the fighter isn't willing to stop, which there are or there are many who will continue to fight on, then the trainer, him or herself, they have to make the decision to shut it down. And Buddy McGirt was pleading with Maxim, hey, Max, I'm going to stop the fight. Please, Max. Please, Max. Please, let me stop the fight. Please, Max. This is Buddy McGirt, one of the good guys in boxing. You know, he's he's trying to shut the fight down. So once he was able to just, you know, he didn't he didn't really get confirmation from the fighter. He just turned around and said, hey, we stopped the fight. So a short time later, you know, Dada Chef left the left the ring and he had to be chaperoned. You know, he was off balance. You know, he walked a couple of paces and then he vomited. And at that time, you know, it was no medical personnel over there to assist this fighter you know, who had just was stopped in the fight. And to me, that just goes to show you how routine sometimes boxing can be, how some people get so complacent in the routine. And they seen another fighter get stopped. So the EMT wasn't really in a hurry to get over there to him. It's not until he got in the back um, outside the door is that, you know, he was he was he was um, groggled, you know, disorientated. And he really couldn't walk on his own um, cognizance, right? So that's when the stretcher pulled up and they was able to buckle him in and put him in the back of an am ambulance and take him to the nearest hospital. At that time, um, they did determine he had to undergo emergency brain surgery. You know, I've seen this before, you know, um, where someone had to have their brain removed. You know, a friend of mine was hit by a car. Well, I had some 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 guys on the motorcycle and a friend of mine hit by a car and they had to take off a part of their brain so it can swell outside of the, um, the skull to prevent further brain damage. And that's exactly what happened here. But unfortunately for Dada Chef, he was he was he was too bad off. You know, I'm not a doctor. It's outside my scope of expertise, but he ended up passing away. Hold on for a second, people. Okay, I'm back. Thanks for waiting, everyone. And then, and 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 then, <laughs> and as I was saying, is that um, this boxer went to the hospital, and you know he just wasn't able to pull out of the brain. You know, um, the punishment that was to his brain, man, is sad in a lot of ways, man. Because you know, like I said, I had I had some friends that go through some similar situations where they had head trauma, and um. You know, thinking of Dada Chef and what he was doing, coming from Russia, trying to make a living for his family and everything. 
and willing to fight and go out on his shield. And it's the difference between going out on your shield when you basically have, have been placed in a predicament in the ring, but you've been doing pretty well during the fight, but you just happen to, you know, face a little controversy and then suffer a knockdown or whatever the case may be. And um, your referee might have stopped it prematurely. And it's that difference of going out on the shield as Dadashev when he was fighting Subriero Matias, who was really punishing him. It didn't look really bad, but over time, his health dilapidated. And in that process, when you when you've seen him get hit with those shots, especially to the body, it, it truly depleted some vigor for him to fight on. And that's where the trainers come into place. That's where the Buddy McGirt's come into place where they're assessing their fighter's condition. And that's the concern that took over Buddy McGirt to say, please, he's pleading with, he's pleading with his fighter. Please. I know what you have going on. I know you're fighting for your family. You're 13 and one. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to make a living. You're trying to fight on. This, this fight is very important. He was fighting an undefeated fighter, man. Super Arrow was undefeated. And the good thing about it, you know, he was, you know, Buddy was just able to just draw the, draw the line and, and, and make the decision and make the call. But, you know, you can't sit up here and say it was too late. You can't put the culpability on Buddy McGurk. You cannot do it. You know, because when he was in the corner and he was out of it, you know, in the sport of boxing, he was still fighting on when he was taking punishment during that bout. He was still returning at, at times. And, you know, it, it gets a little tricky. We're trying to figure it all out. But this young warrior, this soldier man contending in the combat sport. In the art of war, passed away, 28 years old, man. And you, you know, it, it is a um a moment where it awakens you to how serious the sport of boxing is. It is, you know, it, it takes you to a different area. You know, it really have you cogitating out here about the guys that's on the regional level and, and how how tough it is to fight your way up to even get on a televised card. Uh, you know, we joke about it in certain areas on fights. You know, we were just jerk, joking about the Pacquiao and Thurman fight. But when you see a fighter like this, who's fighting for his family to be able to come over here legally with everything that's going on to get his green card, it just hits you on a whole nother level, doesn't it? Um, L. Walker said, big up Mayweather. Um, Lucer said, Oh my god, he was my favorite boxer. Um, Cabro 100 said, Well, I think the um, I think the, the bigger problem in this sport, especially the smaller weight, is the weight cutting. You know, these, these are cutting upwards of 30 pounds to make weight, and you expose yourself to brain trauma. You know, this guy was a super lightweight, you know, um, he was 140, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, I understand what you're saying, Cabral, Cabral 100. You know, cutting cutting upwards of, of 30 pounds. But, you know, we don't really know what he cut and did it attribute to him be, being in the condition he was because he was taking punishment. It was a tough fight. You know what I'm saying? Subriel Matias was a tough fighter. He was undefeated. But I get what you're saying for some fighters who have to cut weight. I understand how that can deplete you in many ways, especially mentally. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's just out scope of my, I mean, outside my scope of authority to know what exactly transpired to take him to the condition, you know, the, 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 the grade for which he went through and being transported off to the hospital and passing away. Um, Cabro said, um, these fighters go into fights already dehydrated and then lose more water during the course of the fight. Now compound with someone hitting you repeatedly. Hey, I agree, man. It's a tough sport there, Cabral. Cabral. I, I get it. 
I totally get what you're saying, man. You know, with any sport such as this to have weight requirements and stipulations, it requires you to have discipline. And unfortunately for everyone, they don't have the discipline to schedule a proper weight cut. Uh, some people are procrastinators. You know, some fighters are procrastinators. They'll wait and then do a hard cut. And it's a lot of changes that go on in your body doing a weight cut, of course. And there's a lot of residual effects to that, especially stepping into the cage or the ring, the mat, whatever the process is, and taking um, blows to the head and to the body. You know, um, it, Timothy Bradley spoke on, you know, I always look at that fight with him and um, Provognikov, right? And I look at the punishment Timothy Bradley took. And, you know, that was the first time where I, I seen, I, I seen him fight Pacquiao. But with Provotnikov, um, Timothy Bradley fight, you know, I still remember to this day when I was watching this fight with Dadashev, it took me back to those Morales. It took me back to the Gotti's and Mickey Ward's. You know what I'm saying? The one man, Will Marquez. It, it, it took me back to when the Israel Vasquez didn't believe in defense. And the, when the crowd was cheering them on, they probably didn't hear or see anything except the fighter that was in front of them. Some fighters get into the heat of the, the battle. And I remember Bradley just taking so much punishment, Provotnikov taking punishment. And Bradley talked about how post-fight, he, he had to go and, and, and get his ch self checked out for um, concussion protocol and found out that up top, there was less light than what it's supposed to be when they was checking his brain function, his neurological test. And from what my understanding was, it was sort of like he had maybe two fights left in him before he suffered some severe damage. And he spoke on that, you know, how he had to have a self-assessment of his career and with his wife. Because, you know, boxers, they go through a different conversation when it comes to going to work. You know what I'm saying? Like the military, when we go on deployment, we pretty much treat it like, okay, this is what I, I supposed to do. Um, my will and everything is the way it's supposed to be. That's all taken care of. And then, you know, you're going to j just say um, when I was going into country, going into c combat over in Iraq, um, you know, you, you feel a sense of loneliness and the depth of isolation is real. You know, especially when you're catching that bird up out of there. And boxers go through the same thing. When they go to a fight, they look at it as if, okay, I've trained for this. I know what I'm supposed to do. Let's get it. You know, in boxing, when you get into a battle and you take punishment, your body does get acclimated to a point. You know, not every fighter is the same, but your body get acclimated. And, you know, looking at Dada Chef take the punishment and return fire and, 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 and giving his trainer, Buddy McGirt, a sense of, okay, he's still in here fighting just a little bit. It's, I shouldn't stop it just yet, you know. And then the sixth round, the seventh round, the eighth round, you know, all those rounds was assessed for punishment and degradation to his con condition. Not until after the 11th, right? You know, Buddy McGirt desperately pleading with his fighter to say, you know, pretty much allow me to stop it because he probably, you know, these trainers know the backstory. They know what's going on with some of these fighters. You know, he knows that guy's fighting to keep the momentum going to potentially, you know, get that big fight for his family to come over. They have a sense of compassion, don't they? And, and, and that's what I felt with Buddy McGirt when he was pleading with his fighter. Please allow me to stop it. Just please to another grown man. Because they understand that the check 
all depends on the fighters winning, continue the momentum. He probably knew how, how much it meant for this Russian fighter to be over here trying to get his green card, trying to compete in the sport of boxing, keep his record. He only had one blemish. He knew deep down inside what it meant for him stopping that fight. And also he knew what it meant for him to allow that fight to go on from Dadashaf um, point of view. Um, Cowboy said in terms of debilitating brain injury, they are non-existent in the heavyweight division. Boxing conversation with Reggie Owen. Salute to you, man. Um, sad situation this year has shown the risk um, posed to these warriors face every time they jump in that ring. Real talk. Um, default said um, that's so sad. You know, um, I'm going to be frank when it comes to certain situations where you have individuals that's competing in the hurt business. You know, it gets repetitive for some of these fighters to compete. They know what they need to do. They know what's going to happen. They know what needs to happen. All they are trying, all they're trying to do is that everything they practice, they're trying to make it applicable to earning a victory. You know what I'm saying? They're trying to strategize and go in there and delegate any and every technique for that battle to earn them a victory. And every fight story is different. Seriously, some of these fighters on the regional level, they get paid light, light money. And, you know, when they usually say light money, they're, they're talking about the paper. But I'm talking about in general, like the paychecks are extremely light. And sometimes if a fighter doesn't perform to the ability, they might have went in there making 600 OK, and then something went on once they left, the, left the ring. They end up finding out they're getting paid 250. It's a dirty game. So when you have fighters that's coming over here from Mexico, Russia. You know, what I'm saying all, um, Japan, you know, all these fighters that's trying to make it over here in the land of the free. They have different backstories. They have a different momentum and energy about them. For which they're fighting for. And we all know, those of you that's been close to the fight game, family means everything, especially when you have those little ones that's growing up, right? And you look them in the eye, you tell them daddy going off to work. And some kids know what their what their parents do, and some do not, because they try to keep them outside of that concern factor so they kid won't be worried about them but when you leave your kids and your wife or your husband or whatever the case may be and you go to the to the battlefield to contend you get acclimated to the travel you get acclimated you say i know what i gotta do i've watched film hey he or she is a tough fighter I have to go in there and do what I got to do. And, you know, if you don't have no money coming in or you need to feed your family. Or whatever route that you're trying to get in your career, you have to do what you have to do. You have to go in there and fight. You totally understand the repercussions to being in the hurt business. You do. As 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 service members, we know the repercussions of going to combat. When I went into combat, when I left on that bird, I knew everything was taken care of. I really didn't care what happened after that because I knew what I signed up for. So when I went on that convoy, and you know, people getting blown up on convoys and freaking facing IEDs and losing limbs, you don't think. You know, some people don't overthink it. You know, I didn't overthink it. But I'm just saying, when it comes to combat, when it comes to adversity, when you sign up for it, you kind of have this complacency about yourself that desensitize you to the severity of what's in store for you. And when it comes to boxing, we've seen it up close and personal of some of these fighters that come off as warriors, come off as very, very tough individuals. They just don't know when to stop. 
you know, you factor in all the energy that is encompassing to the moment. And they just keep on going, keep on punching, keep on punching. You know what I'm saying? I know I can win this. I know I can. And then every shot, they take the pain. They go through a little adversity. You know, they inhale. They, they get that oxygen. Whatever it takes to get that recovery process active. That's the fight game, people. Real talk. That's the fight game. You know, salute to the warrior. He was out here fighting for his family. That man was from a neighboring country. I know we have people over here that have backstories all the same. I'm not I'm not vilipending the fact of jettison the um, accountability of what I see in, in, in the U.S. I, we, have, we have people that come from abused backgrounds off the street, sleeping in cars. We have people straight out the freaking, you know, gutter going in here stepping into the ring for a paycheck we have the 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 stories of so-called heroes of fighters who was able to make it and they was absolutely penniless broke in a bad place and boxing boxing end up helping them out and getting them where they need to be what's going on Cornelius Salute, man. So, you know, um, with every fighter that gets hurt in the ring, yeah, the media want to get on here and, and speak about taking the sport serious and stuff like that. But you always going to have people that will look at a situation like this. If they don't have any type of connection to the fighter, if it's not somebody they familiar with, they, they is you know, just like in life, it's not too much they're going to say about it. But the way I think, you know, what I'm saying the way my brain operate, I kind of connect fights. You know, I, I said this a while ago, you know, in a couple of my lives, when I'm interviewing certain fighters, there's there's legends. When I interview certain fighters that I know their history, when I'm speaking to them, I'm actually reflecting on fights that I've watched them in. And when I'm that close to them, I'm reflecting on fights that they're they've been in and i've looked at and researched and everything so it's kind of like you know how you um you be thinking outside the box sometime like you dare but it's not daydreaming but you're just up here and 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 you're pondering elsewhere thinking about um a subconscious situation when you're when you're in the in the presence of a fighter and you know what battles they've been in but yet you're thinking at that time while you're speaking to them i mean not everybody does that but i have a bad habit of thinking about fights that that particular individual has contended in while i'm actually speaking with them and it's a real bad habit so when i saw this fight with um maxim dadashev i just thought about a lot of fights that was just battles. I'm talking about battles. I remember when Israel Vasquez returned to the sport too early. When they was telling him his eye was not healed and he wanted to return and fight on. And post post fight career, he lo he he loses an eye. When you're in the fight game, when you're in the art of war, when you're in combat, I'm telling you, sometimes the better judgment doesn't prevail. Andrew Thompson say, RIP, my boy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's bad because I look at, you know, once again, when, when, when service member come home in a casket, you know, you think about their family. And how long they've been in the military. The boxing doesn't have a retirement plan. Serious, real talk. Boxing doesn't have a retirement plan. So think about his wife. Think about his kids. And, 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 and tell yourself and ask, did they even have any health insurance to set up for him? You know, a lot of insurance companies may take that as a high risk to even insure 
That's why you hear fighters all the time speaking of unions and all that other stuff. You know, they speak of unions all the time for boxing. So imagine how his wife feel if she really wasn't working. He was the primary breadwinner. And then his kids being too young to understand that daddy's gone. So now, you know, just like in the military, not everything is just there to move on in life. Like it is a burden. When your, your husband or wife come home in a casket and the military tell you, okay, this is what's going on. You're going to get remaining of this for this amount of time. And um, he had this, so we're going to give you that check. Besides that, that's it. Like, hey, it's only so, so many times that your wife will receive the pension of the veteran for the rest of their life and college benefits paid for for the kids for the rest of their life. It has to be a circumstance for which that's, you know, even considered. You know what I'm saying? It's it's tough, man. Like, I'm just thinking about whether his family was taken care of, whether he had health insurance, um, boxing not having a retirement plan. So it's really up to the fighter to get themselves insured. And if they even have enough money to insure themselves. His wife had to come over here and be by his bedside. So you can only imagine what she seen when she walked through the door and, and was there until he passed. That's the deepest as it get. Serious. It's, it's as deep as it get. Like when I've been next to the apron, you know, sometimes I'm just looking through the camera and I'm just zooming in on certain fighters and I can see the expression. I can see them getting hit with shots. I can see them getting hit with body shots. I can I can see the expression up close and personal. But when they, when they get knocked out and they get stiffened and they fall face first to the mat and they ain't moving. It's just a different type of feeling that you get like, damn, this boxing shit is real life. It's crazy. Like the sea dudes get stuck. Your body frees up. Neurologically, your shit shut down. And you can't even move. And you go face first and into the to the mat. And you have to, you know, be revived and everything and massaged and bring you back to, to life. And then you recover. You're able to get up, stand on your feet, go back to the showers. And then get back in training camp if you're healthy enough to pass medicals and return to the square to do it all over again. Now you have a knockout on your record. You're in training. You're going to sparring. Your knockout is on your mind. But yet you want to step back in there to make a living. The reciprocation is real. It's absolutely real, man. It's a reality like no other. That's real talk, man. You know, I still think about Panama, um, Panama Lewis, man, and his fighters, Luis Resto. How Panama Lewis removed padding from the glove and manipulated. You know, his fighters are all, his fighter had already had losses. I think um, Resto had like seven losses already. And, you know, if you don't know about Panama Lewis, he was one of the only trainers to be banned from the sport of boxing for life because he cheated. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like he was gambling, um, you know, like Pete Rose did in, in, in baseball on himself or something like that. But in a fact, he was. He did place money on his fighter, but he owed money to people. So what he did was remove padding from the gloves and he went in there and gave Billy Collins a beating. You know what I'm saying? And um, Billy Collins was undefeated at the time. And not until post fight when, 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 you know, 
Resto went over there and shook the hand of Billy Collins' father. He felt the gloves and was like, shit, it feel like there's no padding in these gloves. It alerted him immediately to the point where he made a, a, a um, complaint. They confiscated the gloves and kept them in the car for a certain period of time. Panama Lewis was up there trying to say that the gloves was tampered with while they was in the back of the car or whatever. They ended up taking them to the lab and found out that the padding was removed. Luis Resto knew that the padding was removed and both of them suffered the penalty. Resto got three years and Panama Lewis, he, I mean, they sent him to the, to the, to the, to the hole. Like, I forgot where he went, whether it was Rikers or what, but they sent him up. They banned him from the sport of boxing for life. And you know, Billy Collins, look, Billy, he lived. But the messed up, it messed up thing about it, it, it fucked him up. The punishment that he endured fucked him up. And he ended up dying. They say it was more so a suicide attempt or whatever the case may be. But he ran his car into a... um a barrier or whatever, and they end up killing himself in a car accident. But hearing about fights like this, we cheer, we cheer, and we cheer, and then we criticize, we criticize, we criticize. You know, I would be a hypocrite to say I haven't criticized a fighter that I felt that wasn't taking that much punishment. You know, I'm not the one in the ring, right? But I'm just saying, I've, I've been there to in that position where I said, it doesn't seem like this fighter's taking too much punishment. Why don't he fight a little bit harder? Why don't he dig deep? We're not in there, but they are. Going to some of the comments, Primo, they just, um, they just gotta have people that observe the fighters closer. It's nice to entertain, but it's not worth your life. Boxing conversations, right? Um, GTS says, rest in peace. Macadamus said, I feel so sick for his kids. And, you know, that's that's where, you know, it took me to that that point, too. Like. You know, his kids and everything, his wife. They, once again, they understand what they're getting into. They, you know, a lot of a lot of women. Love to get with a fighter because it's, it's, a, it's one of those sports where, you know, you know that you have a protector. A woman loves a protector. And, you know, what better protector you're going to get when you have your, your husband fighting on the, in the hardest sport, combat sport, boxing. You know, they love that. They say, hey, my, my husband fights. He's a professional fighter. And, you know, every story is different, but you have that sense of, man, he, I know we protect it. I'm protected. Our kids are going to be protected. You know what I'm saying? And then you stay in the sport and, and, and sustain health to the point of seeing your kids grow up to the point of them stepping into the ring. We've seen it. You know, the Julio Cesar Chavez is, you know, most most recently, you know, you're seeing. Um, even Sugar Ray Leonard's son even boxed for a little bit, but most recently now you're seeing Evan Holyfield. He's finally turning professional. Um, you know, Sugar Shane Mosley. You see people who kids have grown up in the boxing life, and they and they probably thought, "Oh, my dad had heading off the uh, work again. He's a fighter," and then they return home battered and bruised, and then somehow, some way. They kids, once again, I, I like using this, this A word, you know, they get acclimated to seeing the bruises, the scars, and the pain of recovery. And they grow up and they get to a point of wanting to do the exact same thing, some of these kids. And they take up the sport themselves. It happens. But no one is really thinking about the brutality of it because your body get used to the residual punishment that you receive. It gets used to it. Um, Primo said, yeah, I remember being told a Billy story. Yep, for sure. Um, 
Primo said, it's a tough choice when it's said that way. It's tough to feed your family when it's all you know. I just feel done about this one. And, 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 and listen, I have to underscore what Primo just said. It's tough to feed your family when it's all you know. When it's all you know, people. When boxing is all you know and you have to lace up. It's all you know. Hey, I have 23 in the building. Do me a favor and smash that like button, y'all. You know what I'm saying? We just had a soldier pass away. I know I'm media. But it just doesn't take any effort to throw a combination just to smash the thumbs up button. You know, I, I, I got to get on here regardless if this fighter was a familiar name to you all. Out of respect to the integrity for me covering, you know, boxing and MMA and combat sports. I have to get on here and, and speak on it because I know what it's like for him. To have competed to get a green card and, and, and provide for his family now to lose his life. You know what I'm saying? He was doing everything possible to feed his kids. And now he's become a household name. He has a family that has to go on in life without him. You know, just like I just said, what Primo just said, it's tough to feed your family when it's all you know. A lot of fighters, that's all they do know. They know boxing. It's no SAT test. There's no SAT test of boxing. Some of the most astounding stories in the in sport of boxing is what? Individuals that took up the sport for whatever reason they chose to, whether it was because they was being bullied because they was, you know, they had family in the sport. You know, they was curious about it. Boxing has a plethora of freaking backstories that are book worthy. There's no template to the sport of boxing. The turnstile for which rotates in and out is every day. You have somebody going into the sport of boxing for their own reasons. And some and some fighters get in here and find out they damn good at throwing combinations and taking orders to the point of recession and be able to remediate that in a way to, to basically disrupt the rhythm of their opponent. And it works out. Some will make thousands, some will make millions. It's just it's just crazy. It's a, it's, it's a crazy situation to think about, you know. Hey, those of you that's in the building, we just had a, a, a boxer. If you combat sports fan, you know, smash the like button for World Combat Sports. You know, only have five likes right now in this video. I'm in here talking about uh, Maximum Data Chef, 28 year old fighter. Uh, Melo said, this is why top rank is ruining boxing. Macadamus said, I don't know. See a like. I don't even see a like button. You see a thumbs up button? It's a thumbs up button, man. The like button is a thumbs up. Okay. You know, the like button is a thumb ups button. Okay. Um, Andre said, boxing is not a sport. You can find it however you feel. When it's competition and we want to define it by language, my intention is more so orientated around the competition part of it. You're competing. You're competing on levels to make it to a certain pinnacle, which is the championship crown to earn a title. Whether it's a sport or not, it's really not my concern, to be honest. That's very, you know, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lack of attention. I want to give it because we're talking about something that we all understand. 
we understand what it is when you step through the square some of us has actually been through the ropes and felt what it's like to receive a glove to the face. So truly, who gives a crap on whether it's a sport or not? We're really talking about a warrior that stepped in there and, and made the ultimate sacrifice and providing for his family and his wife, and he lost his life. You know, we almost seen the same thing from another fighter. Several times over, you know, year after year. Boxing is an annual sport, y'all. We're going to continue to see, we're going to continue to see incidents like this because once a fighter leaves the ring healthy, they said, okay, tell me when my next fight. I got to get that next check. I got to build my record. I got to keep going. That's the mentality when you have to feed your family and that's all you know. A lot of these, some of these fighters don't graduate high school. They absolutely have no plan B or C. And that's why they're truly focused on, on the rotation of getting back in training camp, if, especially if they didn't have a hard fight, taking a little time off, getting back in training camp, and then returning to the ring and building up their record. If they plan on making this a career, definitely their attention span is for the next fight to increase those numbers in the paycheck to get their name out there and become one of the um, fan favorites and hopefully they're able to get their shot and like and like it's been said before once they get their shot um those who are in the sport for a career path you know to make some out of it they get the title shot they seize the moment um, academics they've been doing this a while. Um, Glizzy said, why couldn't they save him? They did try to save him, man. He was in the hospital. They took a part of his brain out. And, um, you know, so the brain can swell outside the skull because if you leave the brain in there and it swells up inside, we already we already know what happens in that. You know, in that particular situation, you know, we all know what will degrade. And, and how brain dead, you know, look at Cologne. Cologne is, is still suffering from his fight. You know what I'm saying? He's still suffering. He's still in rehabilitation. It's tough, man. Really, it is. It's tough. That's why you hear, you hear fighters calling other fighters bums because they feel they compete in the sport. So they have the right to do that. You know, they feel they have the right to do it. So they call each other bums. They don't think nothing of it because they get in there and they say, man, you can't tell me shit because I compete in the sport. You're not taking the punishment. I am. So who cares what you think? That's real life, man. Just unfortunate, the severity don't hit some of these people thought process until you end up, you know, experiencing something like this. And then all the reality hits, right? People still, like, some people feel a little bit of sympathy and understanding the entire picture for which this um that a chef was going through and then others truly don't care that's just life in general man you know they really don't care that he had a family and kids and he was trying to get a green card by winning he was 13 and one he was trying to do the damn thing look at the fight that um adonis stevenson had we've seen adonis stevenson go in there and do what he do all the time right We've seen that. We've witnessed him stepping into the square and being somewhat the tough guy, the outspoken, you know, with the bravado, trash talking. And he stepped in there with um, Alexander. Ended up going into the hospital, you know, December of 2018. 
And he too had to have a part of his skull removed so his brain can swell outside. And he ended up being able to walk up out of there. You know what I'm saying? Blessings to his family. But Adonis Stevenson, you know, gave his, his, his first interview since leaving the hospital for that long period of time, being able to go home to his wife and have a cognizant conversation, a dialogue with her, being able to speak. Um, I'm not sure as to what his overall medical condition is, but, you know, just to point, point out that he was able to continue his normality in life, you know what I'm saying? Waking up in the morning and being able to identify his family, being able to have a conversation with his wife is, is good, good stuff. It's a blessing. But not everybody is able to um, have that recovery process. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody. Look at McLean. Look at Jerry McLean, man. It's a tough, tough situation to deal with. And we all know McLean was tough as hell. We all know that. Those of you that follow the sport of boxing, you know that. But the body, the body can take and sustain a depth of punishment that one can understand that there's something going on. There's pain and everything. There's pain. I just give my body time to heal. And then you start thinking a little different. The vision is a bit distorted. You know what I'm saying? Your balance isn't there. Your timing is off. And then, you, you know, you got to go get that checkup. And they say, hey, I, I, I'm sorry to tell you, but we, we can't clear you because it's certain things going on with you neurologically. And if you continue to go in there and box and take that punishment, you may place yourself in an incapacitated state or what they consider being a vegetable or, you know, whatever the case is mentally, you know what I'm talking about. Getting to some of the com comments. Um, let me go up a little bit. Ellie Princess said they couldn't save him because his exterior looked fine. It was till he couldn't stand on his own and looked out of it that they stopped it. Okay, I'm just, uh, when you say they couldn't save him, I thought you was talking about the hospital. Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. In the ring, he looked like, because he was returning. You know, like like I said earlier, Data Chef was returning. He was responding to the punches that he was receiving in spurts, in pockets of the fight from um, um, Matias. He's responding. That's why I didn't get stopped too late because he was still showing active feedback to, to the fight. Though, though he was receiving punishment, he was still active. James said, it's never easy to take a situation like this. I love the sport and love participating in it. This hurts though. Bless him and every fighter out there. Salute. Ross said, respect to him for having big heart. His trainer tried to save him, but it was too late. Sad, but rest in peace. You know, Buddy Gert, Buddy McGirt, you know what I'm saying? You can't imagine how Buddy McGirt's feeling right now. Seriously. Um, when I was in Frisco, Texas, man, I was on the elevator with Buddy McGirt several times, man. Cool cat. You, I can't imagine, you know, him being in the sport when he when he did, you know, the fights that he was in. He's one of those guys, you, you know, you can still have a conversation with and he's quick. You know, he's quick on the on the fly. He's still re, uh, responsive, attentive, you know, and just so happened he's one of those guys that you really can't put a, you know, just visibly see that he took an extensive amount of punishment in his career. Very good guy. I really hope people don't attempt to crucify and give him the palm nail treatment and put him on the cross. As if he stopped the fight too late because that can ruin someone's sense of confidence. They can it can ruin them as a person sociably. You know what I'm saying? It can do a lot to a person like Buddy McGirt. One minute you over here, you, your first training get was um, training camp with Sergey Kovalev for his rematch with um, a leader Alvarez, and he does wonders, man. He looks great and everything, and then. You know, you go a couple of fights and you run into a fight like this 
with Maximum Dallas Chef, and people are going to be questioning whether you you um, stopped it too late. I heard Carrie Champion on ESPN ask that very question. Do you think it's anything that Buddy McGirt, his trainer, could have did, you know, to stop that fight earlier than, you know, people always want to talk about things in hindsight. But yet, when it's pronosticated, they say, oh, you're just overthinking it. You're just overthinking it. Why would you think there's a possibility he can go in there and get killed? He's been doing this 15 other times. He's an experienced vet. Why would you pronosticate negativity like that? I'm telling you, that's life. If Buddy McGirt would have said to his fighter, hey, Dada Chef, I understand you're a tough fighter, but, you know, after the 11th round, I'm going to stop the fight because I just think this guy's going to be too much for you. And then, you know, he would have said, you know, you don't have confidence in me. I need another trainer because this guy's negative. Moving on. Um, Boxing Conversation said, right, I forgot about Cologne. Yeah. Come on, Pritchard Cologne, man. Come on, man. Look at some of his fights, man. Dude can, dude can box. Salute to the OG Cologne, man. Still out here recovering, man. This is a rugged sport, and that's why I'm against the use of the word laboring the fighters' bums. Hard way to earn a check. Hard way. Hard way to earn a check. It might not require you to take some tests, the SAT and all this other stuff that goes on, you know, in the corporate world, taking these preliminary um, tests and see if you are um, proficient. You know what I'm saying? They always like using that word proficient and being hired to do this job. Well, boxing, to show that you're proficient, sometimes require taking punishment sometimes require facing adversity you know that's just a sport that is that's been for a long time ellie said ellie princess said i agree primo he was checked there were a couple of rounds where after he took a beating he looked like he was coming back and was landing good punches yeah he was he was responding he was reactive he was letting the people know that he was still in the fight y'all Maximum was still in the fight. We really can't assess, man, how that man felt. Only thing we can do as we was watching this fight on TV is just like was just said. You know what? We really can't, you know, just check the box on. He was in a bad place and they should have stopped the fight earlier because he was returning. He was responding to the action. He was still trying to go in there and contend. Primo said, what well, Max wanted to keep going was bad. I know we have technology to have those in corners to observe body damage more closely and look at the things that can't be observed by the eye, nerves and organs. That's true words, man. Nerves and organs is just... A manifestation in itself you know why because when they when they go bad like some people are financially able to get the assistance you know what i'm saying um like what's his name what was that guy's name um he he ended up having his brain damage reversed and it was through crowd therapy crowd therapy you know he was having a serious situation with you know forgetting things short memory loss and all that and he had the finances to go to certain doctors to try things to reverse what was going on neurologically with the, him with him and a lot of times what people don't understand why why athletes they take ice baths like cold in a lot of ways does miracles for the body you know what I'm saying? There's a medical sequence in that whole entire situation, you know, where it deals with organs and, and things like that, that cold can repair certain situations. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I, yeah, I agree with that, Primo. You know what I'm saying? Observed by the eye, nerves and organs. Boxing Conversation said top ranking ESPN should be taking a moment to a fundraiser for Maxim 
that the family they owe it to the family you know what um reggie yeah man but but i'm sure we've been around the sport long enough um we really don't know the intricate details on what's going to happen with them and and that guy's family you know we really don't know what's going to happen man it's just tough i would hope somebody from top rank say hey this this is the amount of money we can give you and it's only enough to last you to hear and then you're on your own it's the sport just think about this just think about if when a fighter signs up to to a promotion according to how desperate the fighter is because everyone is different now just think of every fight had a contractual that in death you know you get a minimal of a million dollars so that your family and kids just say as a family you know your wife would get a certain amount of money and then your kids would get a certain amount of money up to the to the age of 19 or 20. then a lot of you know families will feel great about being in the sport because they feel like if their husband or wife die in the ring at least they will have some type of financial compensation to continue to carry on in life without actually going broke and being homeless and 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 suffering a hardship like no other you know what i'm saying if the contract said that it would be a whole different life man but that's not the case we know that macadamia said if you watch where buddy tells him he's going to stop the fight he says please buddy is begging for a good 30 seconds yeah he was and maximum is just staring at him maximum does max doesn't say anything you know what i'm saying i knew it was bad when if you look back on it when they gave him the water and he just spit the water out like he didn't turn his head he didn't look for the bucket he just spit the water out in front of him like fuck it you know he was he was feeling bad at that time not because buddy stopped the fight but internally to him his body he was in a deep place man a dark place right now um macadamia said buddy did great most trainers would have let him go another round that's real kim said cologne who preacher cologne man um he's on youtube look him up you know he's in he's in um an incapacitated state i don't i don't like using veg vegetated state because you know he's not in the vegetative state he's incapacitated and partially paralyzed um neurologically impaired uh, uh, uh dehabilitated at the time um they're taking him to extensive training every day to get him back to to um his cognizant you know points you know he's a long way off just the natural ability of you and i he's a long ways off the way he used to communicate you know what I'm saying? And he was a good fighter too. Real talk. Um, Primo said, Buddy did all he could do. Man, Max, I don't know. This is just wild. It is, man. It is. David True, when Buddy is telling him he's ending it, Max doesn't respond, really, even with eye contact. And and, and not only does um, you know, Max Max look at him for a little bit. You know, that's why Buddy was just up close and personal because. He was up there to let him know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm looking out for you. You know, like he's almost about to give him a hug, but the fight wasn't over yet. So when Buddy was that close face to face with Max, he was like letting him know, man, I feel for you. You're taking too much punishment, Max. Please, Max. Please let me stop it, Max. He's giving that guy every benefit, benefit of the doubt. You know why? Because he knows what type of dude he's he is outside of the ring he knows the conversations that him and his fighter has had he knows his family he's seen his wife he knows he's trying to get his green card he understands what is going on with the entire package and why this man is in there fighting buddy mcgurt knows the backstory man and he just wanted to give his fighter the up close and personal let him know please man let me stop it it'll be only your second loss man you can return and fight again 
You're only 13 and one right now, man. It's just a bad way to go, man. Seriously. And I think Max might have been, Max might have been undefeated, to be honest. I think he might have been undefeated. Yeah, Maxim, Maxim, he was undefeated, come to think about it. Both fighters, um, Subriel Mat Matias, Matias was undefeated, and um, Maxim Dadashev was undefeated. Both fighters was undefeated. That's why when, you, you know, Buddy was up close and personal saying, bro, you, you, let me just do this. You'll be okay. One defeat. Just let me do this, man. You're taking too much punishment. Fred said, feel great. Eddie said, rest in peace, Mad Max. Reggie said, um, at Kim, Cologne Pritchard. Um, Primo said, exactly, he was out of it, bro. Macadamus, my friend got knocked out at the park. One punch. He got a concussion and didn't know what he, he, um, he didn't know who he was for a week. That was 20 years ago. And he is never the same. He never really recovered to be who he was. And unfortunately, when you see situations going on in the, in the, in the environment that we live in now, we live in a technology era where a lot of people feel it's cool to try to do one hit or quit us. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people think it's cool for that. And that's why you got people squeezing triggers instead of throwing fists. Because as I always tell somebody, if you try to hold me accountable for something I can't account for, it's going to be a deeper issue. You have people out here throwing one hit of quitters, knocking people out. They landing flat on their face on the pavement, just like Future's bodyguard. From what I heard, he, he had handled a lot of dudes over there. We're talking about in the UK. Had manhandled them, right? Because they was talking. Unfortunately for him, he didn't rem he, he didn't sustain his vigilance and awareness that he still had enemies around him. He still had insurgency, man. And he just walked away. I don't know if it was his ego or whatever the case may be, but I can guarantee you this. He won't do it again. He will not be in a hostile environment such as that. And he's security. And, and let himself turn his back and get cracked in the head by a motherfucking punk ass bitch. Because if you couldn't face this dude face to face, right? And you couldn't, you couldn't mirror up with him and throw hands that way. You had to wait till the man was walking away and then walk up behind him and hit him. And he fell dead on his face, man. So we don't even know what's going on with that situation. But we live in an era where everybody want to put shit on World Star. It can be from kids, youth, to grown-ass adults. You know, hopefully your friend get better, man. You know, like I was saying earlier, my friend was hit by a car. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't my friend. He was a troop of mine in the service. He got hit by a car. So when I went and visited him in the hospital, he was sitting up in the bed with his eyes open, just looking. You can see where they operated on his brain and everything, on his skull or what have you. He was just looking straight ahead. So me, I'm thinking about conversations that we used to have about miscellaneous stuff, home and stuff like that. Just talking about um, missions that's coming, all, all this other stuff. And me not really understanding how bad off he was. I walked in the hospital, his room, and I said, hey, what's up, man? He didn't say anything. So, you know, it's not for me to sit up there and and. And talk about because it's been so long ago to, to call the nurses, you know, any type of obscenities or whatever. But they could have told me how bad he, he was that he wouldn't respond to anything I had to say. So I'm up there, I say, hey, man, what's good, man? You know, it's good to see you up in the bed. I'm up here talking to him. You know, this is Marine. It used to be a troop of mine. I was like, hey, what's going on, man? I mean, how you feel? Because he was sitting up in the bed with his eyes open. Like it was a normal day. But he was gone. Done. Done. For the rest of his life, 
he wouldn't be able to identify or remember anything that happened. Point blank, period. It's not a day go by that I don't think about walking into the hospital and seeing him like that. Um, Dadashev is not just Russian. Okay. This is the this is the uh Kakas Dakistan to give up is a shame. Yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're coming from on that, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I totally understand in that process. It's just like a beat in the Mega Medoff. Um, the drive, you know, him telling that he would have had the answer to his dad from what he did. I get it. I understand, man. Eddie said he turned his back. Dude clocked him with the rock. Okay. I didn't know he hit him with a rock. I thought he hit him with his fist. But either way it goes, security, um, I guess he had his ego to the point where he felt comfortable walking away when he still had insurgency, when he still had the enemies close by actively engaging and instigating. You know what I'm saying? I, I look at that so many times over and I'm like, man, you must have really thought you was Goliath. Because you never should have turned your back on the hostiles. You should have always kept them in your visual. Always. And they knocked that man out cold. So now he's up here around making pretty decent money, being security for future. We really don't know what type of health he in. Anyway, um, Boston Conversation said, right, he let his guard down when the threat was fully eliminated. Um, wasn't fully eliminated. True words, man. True words. The threat was still active. It wasn't closed down. I don't know what the guy was thinking. I don't know if he was hurting. I don't know what the point is. But anyway, it ain't about him today. It's about Maximum Data Chef, a warrior who's in the sport of boxing, who passed away from his injuries. I really, you know, my prayers go out to this young warrior, this soldier, man. And like um, Boxing Conversations said earlier about calling fighters bum, you can look at any of my freaking lives and you won't find me calling a fighter bum. Now, I call another another um, person a bum, but I haven't called a professional fighter or an amateur fighter in this media blitz a bum. Um, Macadamia said, that's fucked up, Reggie. You're right. The nurses should have told you something. Um, yeah, I'll put that out there. Right, he let his guard down when the threat wasn't fully. Um, but yeah, you know, I look at it like I've seen some people. I don't know, man. I I, I just seen some people that um that 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 claim they cover the sport, but really they don't have any sensitivity as to what encompasses, you know, the fighter. Like if you show too much care for a fighter. They want to criticize how you how you basically covering media. You know what I'm saying? If you really aren't harsh on fighters and call it for what it is, just say a fighter go in there and they don't have a really good fight. And you hear some of these media outlets out here dogging them out and saying, man, they ain't shit, man. They they overhyped. They ain't nothing. You know, just like we've seen recently, we see Teofimo Lopez step in there. Mimasa Yuki Nakatani. And he didn't look so good. And people was dogging him out. But before then, when he knocked out Mason Menard, he was the man, homie. When he might knocked out Magdaleno, he was the man. You know what I'm saying? It's all about the appetite. Because boxing fans along with MMA fans, man, they're very entitled. They're not the ones lacing them up. But God damn it, you going in there showing out? They get comfortable. They get spoiled. Just like Josh Greer. Josh Greer bring a pillow to the ring, right? He tell his opponent night-night. The crowd in Newark was very harsh to Josh Greer. But I seen him fight for 12 rounds for the first time, and he boxed. It's called boxing. 
What the fuck are you looking for? But people get on here and saying, yo, Scotty, man, you need to hold these fighters accountable, man. I say, so what you mean? You want me to go out here and disrespect them every time their performance is not right? And, and of course, they're going to come at me about some fighters who I support. Man, you need to you need to keep it 1000 about Deontay Wilder, man. You know, he's this, that and the other. You know, you need to talk about what the other media outlets talk about. But let me ask you this, you know, is the fighters winning? Are they boxing? Because you have fighters that are glorify Floyd Mayweather, but yet they will complain about a boring ass fight when someone actually have to apply their skill set and technical delegation to earn a victory. They mad. Like speaking of the fight, the last fight I was at in Newark, right? I was talking about how, how they was booing um, Josh Greer Jr., fighter who I support uh, 1,000. Before he was signed with top rank, I just like his all-around skill set and everything about the, the guy when it comes to boxing and everything. But then again, when I was in Madison Square Garden, looking at the Terrence Crawford Amir Khan fight, guess who was on the undercard? Shakur Stevenson, right? And he actually put a clinic on Christopher Diaz. You think the crowd was freaking cheering him out on like they was, they was doing in Newark? Hell no. I mean, Shakur Stevens blitzed the shit out of Christopher Diaz. He was hitting him in any way possible from every angle that you can imagine. And the crowd was like up there having sidebar conversations. I'm telling you, man, this sport is crazy. Like he put on a, a outstanding performance and they really wasn't even cheering him on. They was kind of booing him. Then he goes to his hometown. That's his hometown. They cheering the shit out of him. But damn, Josh Greer Jr. does basically the same thing. He's fighting a tough Russian, Nikolai Popovov, and he was there to not get hurt. And that's why I look at the, the, um, the comment that was in here, um, to give up is a shame. I would say that for anybody, but for neighboring countries, I know what you're talking about. I've been all over the world. I totally get it. I've seen the Japanese martial arts on how it's a shame for them in competition to even think about quitting. They were ready. You get knocked out than to quit. I E Roberto Duran, no mas all because Sugar Ray Leonard was making him look crazy. Thailand quitting Russia. You quit. Hell no. You might find yourself in trouble. Colombia. Y'all remember the um the football team, the soccer team who lost the mistake, the guy ended up kicking it in, in, in the opponent's goal. Oh, they went out and found some of them players that was on that team and, and, and executed them. Some countries don't play the fuck around, dog. This shit is real life. Like they have a code, they have a creed to live by. You go out here and fucking quit. You represent a country. In the USA, it's not so much. In the USA, we 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 so large to the point where if a fighter quit, he just have to face social media right now. He has to face the networks, his family, his or her family, Facebook, IG, Twitter. That's who he has to face. But you go to a different, you from a different country and you go over here and quit. And you thinking about going home or your family is already at home over there. Shit. According to how good you are and who you in with. They come get your family. Y'all know what I'm talking about, man. I'm not, I'm not fabricating. Or deriving a fictional story, man, for a ha happy storybook ending. I'm just telling you like that, like that um, comment up top was that's real life. Eddie said on goal, deaf in Columbia. Yeah. You know, these the soccer teams was just putting themselves in a position. They have to win. They have to win. They have to win. And to kick a ball in the on goal, you might as well freaking try to get on the um, the USA bus and, and, and try to damn flee the country. But some of them people, they have family over there. Right? 
um, boxing conversation says some of these um, fans are full of shit about shit. Yeah, that's, that's real talk. Um, boxing's conversation say, Oh, yeah, I think that was soccer team from Iraq or somewhere. It was Columbia, I remember. I mean, I follow the sport of football, aka soccer. I remember that, man. I, I remember saying to myself, I said, These these guys, some of them are gonna face the ultimate test of survival once they leave this game. And sure enough, I don't know who it was, the cartel or whatever, but. They came and found them and killed them. They shot them. All over a game, y'all. And you know, someone early talking about boxing ain't a sport. You actually think I give a fuck on, on what the language details is of, of boxing? I'm, I'm speaking about the dynamics and the matrix. The metrics that it takes to compete in one of the toughest sport in the world, globally. It's been proven. At one minute, the Olympics is fighting with headgear, and then the next, it's no headgear because they're determining through science and, and testing that 10 ounce gloves or whatever you're using combined with headgear can cause much more severe damage than fighting with no headgear. And you get a casual fans that say, Hey, why are they not fighting with headgear? Put protection on. I'm going to tell you like this put on headgear. And get hit and you tell me how it feels. Go right ahead. It's different. It's good to have it on in sparring, of course. It's good to have it on in sparring because you're going round after round after round, you know, and some people rotate, you know, fresh opponents in and out. And you're tiring, fatiguing, and you're taking punishment. So protection, yeah, I get it. But then you go into the Olympic arena where you're judged on a point system and you're going to receive a, a much higher volume of punishment. Um, you know, people might look at that as like. Does headgear really work in this circumstance? Fighter IQ, what's good with you, man? Um, say at World Combat Sports, you're glad you got your um, channel going and live streaming working. My bad. I was mad busy over the week to reach back. No, fight IQ, man. Don't even sweat it, bro. It's all good. We out here grinding in the jungle, this media jungle, man. And yeah, I appreciate the shout out, man, for the channel. It's hard work, um, you know, but it's growing. You know, I always tell the supporters out there, man, salute. Thank you for tuning in. You know, y'all be sure to tune in to Fighter IQ, man. Check it out. You know, I appreciate the ones who's, who definitely support. You know how you hear people to say, I support the ones who support me. I get where they're coming from. You know what I'm saying? I, I truly get it. Because not everybody out here in this boxing game is going to support you. They feel like it's, the plate isn't large enough for everyone to eat. And just something small as someone giving you a shout out and showing support, to me, holds value. You know, just like World Break of Fighting, shout out to World Break of Fighting, man. It's tough out here going to media, the media, the media, man, and grinding with these other media outlets, doing interviews, meeting fighters, establishing a rapport, and getting them to respect you. But those of you that's tuned in today for Maximum Dadashoff, 28 year old, 13 and old before he passed away, super lightweight. Um, sustained severe damage to the point where he was unstable when he was leaving the ring. He ended up getting to the back after he was vomiting and he couldn't really walk. He was disorientated, off balance. And then finally, the EMT came up there and was able to put him on a stretcher and transit him to the local hospital where he underwent immediate brain surgery. In that process, he wasn't able to recover. He ended up passing away. You know, it's tough, man. I had to get on here and talk about it because um, I really didn't know the guy, to be honest. But you know what I did know? I did have a connection with Buddy, Buddy McGirt. I have spoken with him about boxing. Um, I have some videos I haven't even posted about um, Buddy McGirt just yet. But um, 
you know, I, I looked at Buddy plea with this man. And the only thing, once again, me and my broad imagination, I was thinking about the conversations that he was having with Dada Chef outside of boxing. For him to say, please, Max, just please, man. Just please, Max. Just let, let me stop. You're taking too much punishment, Max. Please. One has to assume that the compilation of all his thoughts that was going on and, 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 and reflecting in that moment for him to say, please, instead of just saying, you know what? I'm stopping the fight. It was something else there. He know that man was fighting for his family and country. He knew. He knew what we didn't know. And like I said earlier, I truly hope that you all um, do not jump on here and excoriate Buddy McGirt for stopping the fight when he did. That's a good dude. Very experienced trainer. One of the best in the game. And I truly hope the media doesn't find a way because it's a lot of people in the media vehicle, right? That will sit up here and gather up adversity enough to precipitate to the viewing audience to get viewership. It happens every day. It does. And it, it goes for these media outlets, some of these media outlets too. The adversity of it and everything that, that, that it entails, people will sit up here and try to find a controversial topic to get viewership. It happens. But but salute fight IQ. You know what it is, man. McAdam said, Do you think maybe the time between rounds should be longer to evaluate the fighters? The time between rounds, you have to understand this, McAdam is right. You have to understand the network is, is paying out money for a time slot. You have to understand. So much that goes on to, to pr um, the production of a fight card. You know what I'm saying? So two minutes, a minute, three minutes. Like, look, look at the mixed martial arts. They have freaking five minute rounds. So you say to yourself like, damn, that's a long time. But then if you want to talk about K1, if you want to talk about glory, if you want to talk about the old school Japanese, where they used to have a round that was what? Around what? Seven minutes, eight minutes, something like that. I ask, you know, I, I'm not sure, but they used to fight for that long period of time. I think the time in between rounds when your body is warmed up, I don't think you should be sitting down for a long period of time in between rounds when you just was on your feet contending, battling. I just don't think any more time that's allotted is necessary. That's just my OP. You know what I'm saying? But it's a damn good question, though. Eddie say some people say bare knuckle is safer than gloves. Eddie. In my, in my opinion there, Eddie, I would say yes. The reason why I would say bare knuckles is safe than most is because there's no padding. All right? There's no padding. When you're talking about professional fighting, we're not talking about Future's bodyguard being dropped and knocked out on his face. We're not talking about that. We're talking about professional fighters who know how to roll with punches, know how to take punches, and been contending and competing in the sport. So when you take a bare hand and crush it against someone's forehead, jaw, elbows, you're going to feel it. So what I've learned about being in a bare knuckle, uh, the presence of a bare knuckle spike, is that certain people know how to um, defend a punch. And sometimes it's not with your hands. Like you see some fibers duck their head so you can crack them on top of their head. And who's going to who's going to suffer the most? The one who threw the punch. So you're not going to take as, as much punishment without gloves due to bone to bone contact. 
you're not. Bones will break, fracture, whatever goes on, and um, you won't be able to throw as punch as hard as you did the first time you did. I've seen some fighters that I grew up watching. And when I went to bare knuckle fighting, I, I, I watched fighters that I grew up in mixed martial arts. You know what I'm saying? I watched them go in there and take punishment. And it wasn't as extensive as getting punched with hand wraps and an eight to 10 ounce glove on and, and being punched in the face countless amount of times at full speed, all because you're not worried about breaking your hand. All right. I'm not saying breaking your hand doesn't happen. I'm saying when you talk about bare knuckle fighting, there, there's a lot more that goes into throwing a punch, the placement of it, you know, how much power you put on it. It, it really involves a lot to the process. So with boxing, you have hand wraps, nice knuckle cushion, and you have padding in the gloves. So I would definitely say bare knuckle is safer because you're not going to execute punches over and over again at the same philosophy which you did when you started the fight. Once you find out your knuckles are cracked or your freaking hand is broken, your wrist isn't right. Hell yeah. I've seen it, man. And what you will suffer is cosmetic damage. You will get split open. You will get split open, though. And right now, bare knuckle fighting is five rounds. You know what I'm saying? And it goes by pretty quick, to be honest. Primo said very different. Tony said, I wonder how Buddy McGirt is feeling now. Very sad. I can't imagine how Buddy McGirt is feeling right now. You know? Buddy McGirt is a good dude. I'm pretty sure he shed it. He is probably shedding tears and he's probably looking and reflecting on that moment. And you know what? To be honest, people, this fight is going to affect Buddy for the rest of his life. Because now he, he had a fighter to pass on his watch. It's, it definitely is going to affect him. Definitely. The topic of the conversation whenever Buddy's in the gym, for those who are close to him, they're going to talk about this fight. They're going to ask him. You know what I'm saying? Hey, James, you mind? Can we talk about this? Once everything clear, you're going to see him on interviews. People are going to want to talk to Ed, um, the Buddy McGirt. They're going to want to get his side of the story because there's still some people that are, um, how you put it? They still have doubt and optimism about Buddy McGirt when he stopped the fight. So they're going to have him on the show. They're going to call. I know people right now in the time of mourning, they're probably trying to say, hey, get with, it, get with Buddy's people. I want to be the first to talk to him. This is a big story. This is a big story. We got to get in contact. We need him on here. I don't, I don't see nothing wrong with it because it's boxing. It's part of the sport, but it's just the eagerness, you know what I'm saying, to ask that man first. In the media business, is all who can get a hold of us. Diego Montoya, where 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 he at? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, he passed away in Maryland. He was in the hospital in Maryland, and he passed away. If you're talking about Maximum Dadashov, uh, boxing conversation said, "Well, bash anyone in the media that even attempts to point the blame at, at the OG Buddy McGirt." For real, man, I'm pretty sure he got a lot of people that's gonna be defending him. You know what I'm saying? And like I said before, people are going to want to be first to step up and ask him the ultimate question. Do you believe at any point in time that you should have stopped the fight earlier from what your assessment was? You know what I'm saying? I mean, th this is a cruel and um, over intensive world we live in when it comes to opportunists and in the media business. When you have situations like this in, in, in um, sports, people want to be the first to talk to that individual. Steve Holder said Deontay Wilder recently claimed he won the body on this record. I wonder if he thinks that now. I hope someone coaches him on what to say and what not to say at the time. And you know what? I, you know what I'm saying? I, I knew somebody was going to mention that because I've been supporting the champ for a while. And really, my only take 
on trash talking in the sport of boxing is that you're going to hear people say a lot of things, you know, in the heat of the moment, people are going to say what they, what they have on their mind. You can't just put emphasis on Deontay Wilder and him catching a body when somebody can go out here and say, Hey, Steve, I want to kill you next time I see you. You've been talking shit online. You've been on Twitter. God damn it. Catch this fade. I don't want to hear the shit else you got to say. This is personal. You, you, you think that's not going on in the sport of boxing? With people saying they want to kill one another? They want to take them out? It's been going on for decades, man. Deontay Wilde ain't the first person to talk trash. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when, when you're talking about people dealing with family issues, the, the contentious that went on between him and Dominique Brazil, that was, that was very highlighted in a personal state outside the sport of boxing that bled over into a combat sport where a man fights another man you and i don't know the entire story but obviously it was deep enough for both of them to go back and forth and verbal spar in the public media about it even prompting Dominique Brazil to get on a um, video on YouTube to say what he said, talking about how many kids Deontay got, speaking about his daughter and all that. Every You know, Deontay started boxing because his daughter had spina bifida. But just because he get up here and said he want to get a body on this record. We're in the art of war when it comes to boxing. It's not a sport of morals and principles. This is fucking boxing. This is combat sports. We go to war out here in the military life to defend the country all the time. We hear threats like this all the time. When insurgency come up on you and you know they armed, you're not, and they tell you, I'm going to kill you. You're not going to ask them, say, sure. Why would you want to do that? Don't you have a family? No. They say they want to kill you and they armed. What you going to do? You're going to shoot first. And we ain't going to be satisfied till the body drops. That's life. I don't put too much emphasis on what I've known in boxing and what I've seen as far as fighters. It's been so many fighters that threaten one another. I still look at Larry Donald. When Riddick Bo gave him a two piece at the press conference, no gloves on professional heavyweights, some of the hardest hitters in the game. He wasn't punished. He wasn't fined. You know what I'm saying? You know how they say the ultimate test of a man is not how you feel in comfort and convenience. Imagine how Vander Holyfield felt when he got bit on both of his ears from Mike Tyson. But the way Mike Tyson is right now, they love him. They love him. They love him. But yet he tried to bite a Vander Holyfield's ear off. He dislodged a portion of his cartilage. But no one's talking about that. They want to talk about Deontay Wilder catching the body. I mean, you have the right to your OP, man. But I'm just saying. Y'all really focus on, 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 on trash talking and boxing for real. It takes me back to Allison and I was talking about you talking about practice. Are we talking about threats? Really? In the sport of boxing, we're talking about threats. When the motherfucker say he about to split the ropes. And in your life, you really, you're not going to train harder to go in there and make sure that doesn't happen? Are you going to get on social media and say, you know what? Um, I enjoy the sport I, I'm in at the moment, but um, I want to tell all my fans I'm, I won't be taking this fight. And, and, you know, furthermore, I might even consider not contending in the sport I love anymore. And they'll be like, why? why what, where's all this? Well, World Combat Sports, did you hear my opponent? Um, he basically said he, he's, he's willing to end my life in the ring. And I just don't see why he's that upset. So why would I want to compete in a sport that someone would actually speak that way of me? You know what I'm saying? People are going to be like, man, get your ass out, out of here. You ain't built for this. Michael Gray said, not sure if you covered it, but weight cuts play a terrific role in these types of injuries. 
Listen, Michael Gray, you're absolutely right. Weight cuts do play a significant role in the, in the, in the dilapidation of a fighter's health. OK, that's why weight cuts. Listen. When the UFC one came out, that was catch weights. Horse Gracie won the tournament when he was fighting fighters that outweighed him 50 pounds to 100 plus. Right. In order for combat sports to be taken serious and respected by the viewing public who money to see these fighters contend and compete, there must be organization. Could you imagine someone like Lomachenko saying he's going to step up? Okay, he's going to step up to fight somebody like Caleb Plant. You know what I'm saying? Or Olesanik Yusik. Could you imagine someone that's in the Bantamweight division saying, guess what? Mikey Garcia stepped up two weight classes. I want to go up there and fuck around with Errol Spence or Terrence Crawford. But you're fighting at 118 right now. I don't fucking care. I'm daring to be great. Now, the perception and simulation that we have as viewing audience, right? We'll probably look at a banner weight and be like, dude, you really need to chill with that. You're doing too much right now. If you was to think about contending at a weight, you would get stumped. It would be murder. You won't be able to fight again. The only reason they have weight classes is for organization. So they have to put, and plus it provides money for boxing. Boxing has so many sanctioned bodies. It provides wealth and income and revenue for the sport itself. So now we have a dilemma, people. The weight cut. The reason, the residual effect that it has when a fighter is cutting weight. Now, for me, going out here, trying to interview fighters on fight week, right? When they, before the weigh in, you do have a different attitude from a fighter prior to the weigh in and after the weigh in period. We don't know if that fighter had a bad weight cut, if they did it, you know, in a timely manner, discipline, or you had a fighter who's undisciplined and was busy eating the wrong foods and want to make a, a sharp weight cut at the end, which is detrimental to your body. It's detrimental. Weight cuts are brutal. I've been there, done that. Weight cuts are brutal. Those pictures when I was competing, that I was shredded. You're talking about the guy who went from 230. When I was competing and, 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 and dropping Depleting my body fat. I got down to what I was in high school. I was at 186. 186. It sucked. Believe me, that shit sucked. Waiting in a competition to go on stage, dry, dry as fuck, up there eating sweet potatoes, complex carbs. Sucking on fucking ice. It sucks, man. Mentally, you don't want to be fucking bothered. You don't want to say shit to anyone. All you want is to get ready to go on stage, get that shit over with. And like the fighters, they get ready to go the way in, scale up, make weight, and then eat. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's. It's, it's, it's a process that no one thinks about. Like, for those of you that follow mixed martial arts, you remember when Cyborg was, was trying to come to the UFC and they documented how bad her weight cut was and she was crying. Um, Darren Till even. Like, Darren Till was trying to compete at a certain weight that, you know, many thought, okay, you know, him, him competing at this weight is good. But he, his weight cut, was fucked up. You know, he went partially blind for a minute. He lost consciousness. Cyborg was crying like a baby. When they when they had hot towels and shit trying to trying to get her down to 140. Weight cut is a dark side. It's a dark side, man. 
If a fighter don't have the best attitude before weigh-ins, you all need to understand that, fight fans. Stop fucking with them. They're not feeling good. We really truly don't know how their weight cut went. Some people have the blessing on cutting weight, their discipline to eat the right foods and get out there and cut weight and get the cardio. And then some people behind closed doors, they having a burger. They having too many carbs. Because I'm going to tell you, carbs provide energy. When you deplete carbs, when you deplete carbs from your system, according to what your levels are like, you know, as far as you get, you know, not everybody have a nutritionist, but chemically your body starts to communicate differently. People I'm taking from somebody who's, who's been there. I mean, you, you really get a craving when your sugar level levels fluctuate, you really get a craving to eat certain foods that you never would eat. If you was just eating regular, like when you really start to cut weight and your body, body weight decreases, you really want to fiend for certain foods, man. You want a double decker chocolate fudge cake with two scoops of ice cream on top. Just give it to me and leave me the fuck alone. I'm going to go in the closet and enjoy my cake and ice cream. And then when I come out, I'm going to drink a whole lot of water. and I'm going to get back to the gym. But right now, I just want I just want some dessert. That's all. Macadamia said, it's so crazy that Max didn't even look beat up. He wasn't bleeding everywhere. True words, man. The visual is everything, man. You're right, Macadamia, man. You're right. Um, um, Michael Gray says, it's a fighter's mentality. Um, Eddie, let me go back up here. Primo said, of course, every trainer always sees that for a fighter, for their fighter. But we have to take into consideration Max fighting spirit. I repeat, Max's fighting spirit. The wildest shit is just ignorant right now. We don't need it. Real talk. Michael Ray, also the thing, it shouldn't be Buddy's fault at all. He never had to stop it. It takes a lot of someone to stop because you know these fighters train day in and day out and won't give up. Repeat. Real. That's true words, man. Eddie said, I know the UFC banned rehydrating with the IV bags. Can boxers use them? Weight cuts suck. It's all about the commission and who approves all that, man. Every commission is different. Weight cuts is a part of simulated reasoning. When people believe that a fighter that weighs 120 cannot comfortably or what they call fairly compete against a fighter that's 160, 170. Like when you have that much of the disparity when it comes to weight, people start to insinuate a lot of shit. Then you know that that, that 120 pound might be damn tough as shit. I've heard some stories about some lightweight fighters that have put hands on some some fighters at a uh, at a higher weight class. You know. If I really want my channel to go viral right now and get 10,000 freaking subscribers, shit, that's all I have to say. But guess what? When I see that, that, that fighter again, when I see this fighter who's a world champion right now who got knocked the fuck out, it's going to be a hard time to travel when I go to these places and, and do media. But it just goes to show you, you take a fighter from a lighter weight class. Oh, he definitely, he or she definitely potentially can knock out a fighter from a heavier weight class. And this is not from one person. This is from various sources that this went down. Various. There's no way I'm going to violate the code. No damn way. Not today. Not tomorrow. Um. Primo said, but then point blank is the fighters are fighting for their lives inside the ring. Michael Gray say, I've cut weight for wrestling my whole life. It changes my attitude, motivation, etc. If you know that you know your body, you can tell you're not right. Dehydration 
is nothing to mess around with. And you, you, you're totally right on that, Michael. Macadamia said, good check. I got to get back to work before I get my ass fired. I did hit the um the like button. Be easy. Godspeed to you, um, Maxim. Salute to you, Macadamia. Stop. Um, thanks for dropping through, my man. I appreciate the support and pass the word about World Combat Sports, man. Hey, I got 24 in the building. Hey, do me a favor, man. Get the likes up to freaking 30. You know, I'm sending 19 right now. I don't care about the right side. I just care about the left side, just like the boxing ledger. I care about the wins. You know, it doesn't take any effort, people. If you're tuning in to the to the um to World Combat Sports, just cl click that thumbs up. Come on, man. It doesn't take nothing but a moment to you to mentally confirm that you support World Combat Sports and press that thumbs up. We're we're basically showing homage to a warrior that has passed a 28 year old who has left his family who is who has basically put it all on the line and sacrificed in the ring he is now gone he has passed away his family is in mourning his wife is is a widow and his kids are without their father because he went into the ring and he competed to the best of his ability and when it came down to his trainer buddy mcgirt telling him point blank that i need to stop this you're taking too much punishment from matthias and though the fight was stopped the damage was already there you know what i'm saying it was already there I wouldn't say it was too late because if you look at the fight, it just didn't seem like the man was in a terrible place. Like if you watch the body work, though, the body work did seem like it was it was depleting. You know what I'm saying? It, it did seem like it was depleting the energy. You know, it was breaking down. It was degrading his health. You know what I'm saying? Man, salute, warrior. You know what I'm saying? This is a tough sport, you know. And um, you know, with weight cutting to 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 balance the scales or lose your pay, it's continue. It's gonna continue. It's not going anywhere, people. You know, you gotta cut weight to make the weight. And doing in between fights, man, you have to make sure you're disciplined enough not to balloon up or you know, drink alcohol, you know, uh, smoke weed enough to the point where you're gaining unnecessary pounds and then you get the call. According to what level, what tier fighting you on, you get the call. And you have only, you know, what, four weeks, five weeks, whatever the case may be to step into the ring. Now you got to do a binge. You got to motherfucking do one of those weight cuts. And impromptu weight cuts are brutal. They're brutal, man. They're absolutely brutal. And they do have a lot to do with fighters walking in here, getting concussed. You know, like I said before, I can only speak from, you know, research and experience and all this other reading. But I'm not medically qualified to give you a determining factor as to what causes concuss and brain damage in a particular situation because every fight is different that's period that goes without saying every fight is different mike said um so you feel that fighters even nowadays can compete with each other at different sizes i have mixed thoughts on that i mean competition is so high nowadays with um better athletes all around it's according to what sport you're talking about um like from the time I've been covering sport there, Michael, I've seen bigger guys be taken down by smaller guys, especially in when you want to talk about jujitsu competitions, um, even martial arts competitions. I've seen smaller guys take out bigger guys. We've seen it in boxing. You know what I'm saying? 
I mean, I've seen it. This is not something I'm making up. You have to see it all go down for you to, you know, make that assessment as to smaller guys fighting heavier guys and if it's fair or not. You know, to to the perception, to the initial perception of someone, they're gonna say, Oh, that's not fair. You know, look how much so and so weighs. But you you really have to do a consensus of taking several fights where you have a fighter that outweighs a fighter by a huge amount. And then you assess how that performance worked. Um, i.e., let's say one of one of my good, good um Good fighters that I, that I follow for quite some time, Benson Henderson. Benson Hen Henderson stepped in there with Brandon Thatch, right? Brandon Thatch was huge compared to Benson Henderson, but his his footwork and his movement stifled the bigger Brandon, and he was able to land punches and land punches. Man, I'm talking about punishing punches to the bigger. I'm talking about Brandon Thatch. Look up the fight. He ended up subbing out Brandon Thatch after he broke him down with strikes. He ended up subbing him out with an RNC. You've had fighters to step in there that was much bigger in certain disciplines. And boxing is no different. And the reason why I'm saying that, Michael, because if you, if you got an issue with it, you have every right. But check this out. You just can't have an issue with it with the medium to lightweight classes. I mean, lightweight to medium classes. You know why? Because if if heavyweight, if you're going to have someone like Deontay Wilder, right? And I'm going to put him in a different light. If you have Deontay Wilder competing at 205, 209, whatever the case, he's under 210. He's right. He's right on the front doorstep of competing at cruiserweight. Then you have an opponent that outweighs him about 50 or 60 pounds all because it's heavyweight division they don't have a super heavyweight so you have Deontay fighting at 210 his opponent like 270 isn't that outside of the weight normality or is it just pertains to the heavyweight division what about big baby miller Jarrell, big baby miller when he fought lucas brown big um, big baby miller was like 304 What about who else um, that I can um, talk about? I mean, when you get to the heavyweight division, the weight disparity is, is, is crazy. It's incredible. The weight disparity. You're looking at Jarrell Miller, who's 311, 314, and then he's fighting a fighter that's 227. I mean, isn't that a huge weight disparity? Seriously. It's a huge weight disparity, and it cannot be given a, a waiver because it's the heavyweight division. You can't give it a, a weight disparity. Look up the fight with Adamick. Look at that fight. Jarrell Miller and Adamick. That's 53 and 5. Look at what Jarrell Miller weighed versus what Adamick weighed. Tom Adamick, I believe his name was. Check out the weight disparity on that. It's absurd. I think Adam was under 230. Yeah. I've just seen fights in person, man. I, I really don't pay too much attention about the weight disparity. You know, because in some facets, they're going to have the advantage. But when it comes to technical skill set, smarts, adaptation, and um, making changes and executing your fight plan, I mean, one one can win. I see it in jujitsu all the time, man. I see small guys, and we're talking about a grappling. We're talking about a grappling discipline. I see smaller guys who 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 are considered less to have less strength than their their larger counterparts, and they get subbed. So you so are we talking about it all deals with punches and not movement? Because in grappling, I see bigger guys being subbed all the time. Wouldn't the bigger guy be able to lay on the smaller guy, be more stronger than the smaller guy? 
I mean, look at look at the 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, the Martinez brothers, when they compete in Polaris competitions, the no-gi competitions and grappling. Look at his brother, Gio, how he tapped out that huge guy that was like 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, I mean, it all depends on the skill set of the fighter, man. Um, Michael say, why people cut weight in order to get that little bit of edge over their opponent? They cut weight because if if you're in a sport that demands that you meet a weight, um, the weight standards, and there's a weight limit, you have to go in at that weight limit or you lose or you become Daniel Jacobs. When he fought Canelo, they put a freaking rehydration clause in there. And they end up costing that man 500000 You know what I'm saying? If, if you have weight rehydration clauses in there for whatever reason, this, that, and the other, um, just say Canelo fight 160, right? And just say Daniel Jacobs rehydrated to 170, 175. The dialogue cannot be that when you rehydrate, you get faster. Sometimes when you your body recovers and rehydrate, it really fucks you up. Like you might say, oh, you're going to have more power. In some people cases, they rehydrate too much. They're much slower over the course of the fight than someone who only rehydrates, you know, three or four pounds or whatever the case may be. Like when you look at um, Eris Landy Laura and Jared Swift Hurd when they fought, Jared Swift Hurd looks huge all the time in the ring. But but Eris Landy Laura came in at like 160, what, two? And Jared Hurd on fight night with 163, give or take. But in the ring, Jared Hurd looked like the much bigger fighter. James said, what do you think about Dadashev's opponent in thinking and feeling? Um, Sabriel Matias, he did what he had to do. Undefeated. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, I'm I, I'm pretty sure Matthias went home with the victory, and that fight is going to be on his thought process for the rest of his life because he was the last fighter that Dadashev faced. That's that's real. That's real, people. Just like Buddy McGirt. Maximum Dadashev would be on Buddy McGirt's mind for the rest of his life. Period. Michael said, I feel that. James Quirk is. Um, Freddie said, first I hear WCS. It's a tough sport. The casual boxing fans don't understand what these uh, fighters have to sacrifice. Glad to hear some real talk for a change. I appreciate that, Freddie. Salute and thank you for tuning in, my brother. You know, I don't try to say everything right because I ain't perfect. But you'll be, am be amazed at how much criticism I get for not coming out here just talking shit every day. You know what I'm saying? Not treating fighters like shit. I get criticized for not. You know, people, people would get... People have the the poor inclination at, at times to place perception on someone. You know, like they won't even consider, you know, someone was in the military for 20 years, what I learned during that time, right? And that way I treat people. And, you know, I treat people with respect. I treat people on how I want to be, be, be treated, right? I give them benefit of the doubt. Now, of course, that don't mean I'm a walkover. Don't, you know, don't take my kindness for weakness. And don't try to challenge me just because I wore the camouflage for that amount of time. I just look at it when it comes to media. Some people look at a guy who may be in military regs as a civilian right now and speak a certain way out of respect to these fighters. They act like I should be going around goddamn talking shit to these fighters. Getting on here. You know, if a fighter didn't perform up to up, up to my standards, I should go on here and dog these fighters out. And genuinely, that's not the way I 
feel if if a fighter who I support really doesn't go in there and box and perform well, why am I going to jump on the mic and act like I was in the corner giving him instructions and he didn't comply with me? Why the fuck would I do that? Why? There's leaders and there's followers. I always tell people, I can't sit up here and communicate with people who I can't learn shit from. People are going to judge you no matter what. You can get on here and talk a certain way and look a certain way and people make up all these motherfucking lies about you just because you don't fit what they are around or they circle of people. I try to treat these fighters with goddamn respect. Like every fighter is not going to fuck with you. They're just not. And some fighters will. It's a doggy dog world out here. You have to build a rapport. But will I, what I won't do is sit up here and continue to kiss ass to, to, to satisfy everyone who I believe I should just to get some subscribers to my channel. That's impossible. I can't do that. They're going to have to come. They're going to have to, they're going to have to approach. They're going to have to listen to the content. They're going to have to check out my vids and see them out here hustling and um, just take it from there. That's all I could tell you, but I appreciate you looking out there, Freddie. Michael said, that's why they do worry. It was a continuation of the previous com comment. Um, notorious MMA. Um, notorious MMA brought me to a point of uh, Conor McGregor, right? If you look at when he was fighting at featherweight, he used to cut down to 145 and look like a skeleton with skin. I mean, it was amazing to see him on the scales looking that dunt. Well, I put it this way, gunt. Like he was drawn in, sucked in. And for him to fight and win a championship at the featherweight division, it's crazy. For him to knock out Jose Aldo in 13 seconds when he was that drawn up from a weight cut, it's respectable. It is. It's fucking respectable. I can't imagine what he felt like cutting down to that weight the way he did. I can't, uh, I can't imagine what freaking Anthony Rumble Johnson was feeling like when he was competing at a, light, a lighter weight class and to see how big he is right now. He's every bit of heavyweight right now. Every bit. When I seen him in person, I say, okay, shit. Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Rumble Johnson is a big dude. Weight cuts is for those who do them <laughs> have to have to go through this annually. It's a brutal reality. I, ain't, I, I, I can't I can't say, I ain't, you know, I ain't mad at you for getting the bag. You got to do what you got to do. In, in, in your your occupation and your field of expertise. If, if, if weight cut is required for you, then you have to maintain discipline enough not to blow up too much and, and come back down to reality when it get close to fight and be able to shed those pounds. You have to be able to do that, people. Like, it's, a, it's tough. Weight cuts fucking suck. I always used to think about like what it would be like to really cut weight. And when I was shredding down, like I always maintain good eating habits. That's just me. Push-ups, crunches, setups. That's what I grew up off of. Herschel Walker. He used to work out and do that shit a lot. I still hold that to this day and control the fork, right? You got to be able to control the fork. And if you're fucking around with the spoon, you better know how to goddamn have a reserve to it. People know what I'm talking about. It's different between the fork and then when you put down the fork, you pick up a spoon. That means you probably getting dessert. You got to be able to understand what glass of water mean. Weight cuts are brutal. So when I look at the Manny Pacquiao fight and the Keith Thurman, I'm like, damn, was this dude fucking taking this shit serious? Because, you know, when I look at the fight, yeah, I'm mentioning goddamn, you know, no drug testing because shit, you can cut weight with certain things 
that that enhances weight cut it's they're out there just look them up but when you get a fight there's no weight cut right i'm changing lanes a little bit because i'm, I'm getting to keith thurman right so it goes in there against a 41 year old fight in manny pack everybody want to jump on here because i'm saying there was no drug testing and yeah I'm, I'm i'm keeping it like if if the platform of people that's on these huge these big networks are talking the same narrative and paulie is saying he's giving an educated opinion but people know paulie as a former champion right they know him as one of the best analyst commentators out there in the sport so when he said he's giving his educated opinion from the boxing platform for which he is admired and people listen to him and he's saying he don't respect Manny Pacquiao because he feel that he was dirty over the years that's his opinion but when I say it on social media and I haven't been a boxer I never use it to that depth I just said public record it was no fucking drug test there was no drug test no drug drug test somebody put on there this morning um i, I get a notification i think scotty would want to read this so i read this shit and they up there have a tweet they have a tweet from somebody saying somebody that's, that's not even associated on manny pacquiao team they're saying manny pacquiao was tested three times before the fight why the fuck are you gonna test manny pacquiao three times the day of the fight if they if why would they spend more money in the budget y'all don't understand the drug testing costs it costs for the for these drug companies to come out here and test these fighters it's not free so if there's no drug testing you just you're just gonna go up here and, and, and give up urine and blood for who if the contract says no drug testing why in the hell will a fighter volunteer their services to take a, take a drug test why don't come to me with that aftermath type post-fight shit because people who really digging into this the way manny pacquiao looked him taking those right hands from thurman and still standing not being wobbled at his age and he's been in some wars he's been slept he has several losses to his ledger you're trying to tell me a 41 year old who who haven't had a knockout and don't know how long you know we, we want to talk about lucas matisse who was on the on the front door of retirement what about jeff horn though did he knock out jeff horn so he goes in here and drops keith thurman how many times keith keith thurman been dropped in his career did he not take hard punches from who again? Sean Porter hit him with everything in the kitchen saying, even goddamn Danny Garcia. Joseph Cito Lopez um, touched Thurman on the on chin and then drop him. Last time I checked, he was much younger than Manny Pacquiao, right? But all of a sudden, a division world champion goes in here and drop Keith Thurman. And, and and really looked pretty decent with his cardio up to the mid rounds and then you know he, he he did look a little exhausted and then people say well he looked a little exhausted in the in the later round i don't give a fuck that don't have anything to do with nothing just because if you have pads in your system that's supposed to say you won't get tired to a point it depends on what you're doing every body composition is different and I continue to say it. Why no drug testing if the normality across the board for these fighters is to have random drug testing? You think Errol Spence is going to fight Sean Porter? You think Floyd Mayweather say he got the call about Manny Pacquiao to subject him to Olympic style training? It was a reason that Floyd say, I want to make sure I'm looking out for my health and my best interest when it comes to fighting in the ring. Smart smart floyd mayweather say i want to have a long career so i'm gonna I'm work on my defense hit and not get hit people want to sit up here and put floyd mayweather's name on social media almost every day in these forums 
But then, as you are my Floyd Mayweather, you want to sit here and look at Keith Thurman and Manny Pacquiao. And you always want to try to elevate Manny Pacquiao over Floyd Mayweather. Just because the speculation, you want to put it in denial. Just because he's the eight division champion. He is a legend. He is a future Hall of Famer. Absolutely. There's been speculation like everything else. And when you have a fight at this point in your career, where was his other couple of fights before now? Didn't he just fight in Malaysia or something like that? And they try to say it was for t um, tax purposes. But the drug testing is different over there, right? Why would you come up here with no fucking drug testing? You think Mikey Garcia is going in there with Errol Spence with no drug testing? Why, why did Jarrell Miller just get caught? Drug testing. Drug testing. Yes, he lost millions. When I talk to him, I can't sit up here. I'm not going to dog Jarrell Miller out, man. Because when I talk to him, I can feel that shit that was on his brain, on his thought process. He felt some type of way. That's why I couldn't get a real in-depth interview. It was an impromptu interview in the masses, in the chaos. Right before Shakur Stevens was coming to fight. So that's why the interview is kind of short like that. But I'm not going to go ahead and fuck that man with some bullshit. When he already down, the man squandered millions of dollars and the opportunity to be to be Andy Ruiz. Jarrell Miller should have been Andy Ruiz. It would have changed his whole life. So when I hear him say what he said, I know the shit on his mind. But why did he get put in position? Drug testing. Drug testing. He got caught. So why people acting like Manny Pacquiao if somehow, some way, is no drug testing? That it's all copacetic. It's not, man. And and to, to caveat to my point about Keith Thurman with the fork and the spoon, people, I saw motherfucking Keith Thurman eating ice cream before his fight. And that didn't sit well with me, with him eating dairy products and pizza or whatever the fuck he was doing. I just, I just, it, it, it bewildered me that the WBA super welterweight champion, right? I'm not talking about he's a super welterweight, okay? I'm talking about he's the WBA super champion, all right? The welterweight division. Before you all drop comments on here, well, Keith Thurman, he fights it welterweight. <laughs> okay. The WBA super champion is eating ice cream. Ice cream before the toughest fight of his career. You know, allegedly. He's out gambling. They have pictures of him out in the casinos. I just lost respect when other people was up here dogging the fuck out of Keith Thurman. I was like, man, you know, Keith might just be a different type of dude, man. You know, him up on top of a mountain playing a motherfucking flute, a trumpet or whatever he was doing. You know, challenge his Gundy. But to see him go out the way he did and take that first L. It's just easy for me to. Insinuate a lot of shit that he didn't take that he didn't take that fight serious. You know, what I'm saying you telling me you're 29 and oh. And you ain't afraid to let your old go. Then why waste all damn time? And then for what I'm hearing about your bag, Manny Pacquiao, who's the WBA regular champion. He earned more money than you did, Keith Thurman. And you up here eating ice cream like you satisfied with everything that led up to that fight. You satisfied with your pay. You satisfied with your performance with Josecito Lopez. You satisfied with everything. And you go ahead and hit the casinos and hit the ice cream, eat pizza. Now you don't lost the masses. You don't lost the masses of fan. They ain't gonna take you serious. And now I'm hearing I'm hearing Adrian Broner is thinking about inserting himself into the fray.
to fight Keith Thurman. Why? Because Keith Thurman was busy up here trying to be a ponytail comedian, talking about how short Manny Pacquiao arms was. Now he's became a meme with that dumb look he had on his face when he was looking up at Manny Pacquiao, like Goo Goo Gaga. Shit. Maybe I shouldn't have ate that goddamn Dairy Queen special. He sat you on your ass. Now Adrian Brown is saying, since you was talking about you ain't AB, fight me. So now I'm, I'm telling people online, right? Um, those of you that's tuning in, I'm telling people, right? I'm saying, okay, Adrian Brown just said he ain't fighting at motherfucking 147. He's done. He's fighting at 140. He just said that shit. That's why you can't believe everything. And then turn around and people up here talking about, hey, Adrian Brown and Keith Thurman, who you got? Okay, so if Keith Thurman was eating ice cream, what make you think he's going to make 140, junior welterweight? What make you think fighters, what, no, what make you think the boxing fans is going to tune in to see Adrian Brown and Keith Thurman right now? Only because they saying that Adrian Broner wasn't dropped by Manny Pacquiao. So he looks better than Keith Thurman did because Keith Thurman was dropped. Now they want to try to match up a fight and say Adrian Broner versus Keith Thurman. We all know how that's going to turn out. It don't matter how many times Adrian Broner say, you know what, I'm going to knock that boy out, this and that. Man, come on, bro. Come on. Stop it. Stop it, man. Stop it. Y'all fight fans need to stop that shit too, man. Stop it. Stop trying to sit up here and put all these pictures and post together and 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 try to hype this agent Ron. He just said to Radio Raheem that he ain't fighting well to wait no more. He is fighting 140. Adrian Broner should be sitting at three L's right now, really. He got a gift of a draw with Jesse Vargas, which I thought was much more active during the first half of the fight. And then, you know, Adrian Broner had a rally mid-fight. And he was able to get a draw to fight another day to get that Manny Pacquiao fight. But in reality, in my opinion, he, he, he potentially should have had three L's in a row. But Adrian Braun is a ticket seller. People like Adrian Braun because Adrian will stick to the script. Every time it comes time for Adrian Braun to the, the, the freaking um, step step on 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 the stage, man, I'm gonna fuck that boy up, man. I'm gonna fuck that boy up. But yet, you know, he get arrested six times before the fight. And you never see him in court. But people are like, oh, Agent Broner got arrested for what? Oh, um, he tried to steal some crab legs out the store like James Winston. But he, in the process, he went back and tried to retrieve the season and for it. And then he got arrested. But besides that, he was free. He was free and clear. What Agent Broner do? Oh, he was in a, a mall down here in the A. And a female said that he, 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 he touched her inappropriately. And, and they show the cameras, they show the freaking um, somebody on film escorting him out the mall and then handcuffs and shit. You don't hear nothing else about it. Agent Brown on a high speed chase. What he driving? I don't know. They say it was one of Floyd's Bugattis. I don't know. You don't hear shit else about it, right? Every time Agent Brown has a fight coming up, he, he provides some humor. He provides some suspense, some intrigue to the plot. And then that that intrigue and suspense does not resonate over to his performances. That's just that's just what it is, man. That's just public record, y'all. I don't want to see Keith Thurman and Adrian Broner. I don't. I don't want to see that fight. Michael Gray, appreciate that, man. Say subscribe. Great content and knowledge. Hey, man, appreciate that, man. Pass the word there, Mike. Thanks for tuning in, my brother. I appreciate that. Salute to you. Have a wonderful rest of your week.
Freddie said Brandon Rios balloon the 170 versus T, um, T Bradley um, from 146. He was a shell of himself, and Bradley made him pay. Hey, hey Freddie, you motherfucking right. Good shit. Just because a fighter balloon up in weight doesn't mean he's going to have the advantage. You come in there and put on all that fucking weight and get to the middle rounds and you and you feel like a, a freaking turtle with three shells and and a damn capacitated leg with a damn boot on it. You feel all fucked up. Sluggish as shit. You cannot sit up here and think that putting on weight it's going to come with power. The body for, for people in general, it works different. Like seriously, when you rehydrate, everyone's body is different. Like it's all about what you rehydrate with. It's all about how your body responds to the weight cut. I'm serious. When you want to sit up here and criticize these fighters, when they come in there and they seem a little sluggish sometime, but yet they've been knocking motherfuckers out. And they come in there and have one of those performances where they never really shift gears. You got to think of the weight cut. You have to think about how their body is responding to the to the to the pace. It's really important that you understand that how the body responds to the pace. It's a lot that goes into that, y'all. Everybody is different. But back to Keith Thurman, I think, um, you know, I don't have any regulations over freaking Facebook and shit. But y'all just need to chill with that damn Adrian Broning and, and Keith Thurman. Don't do it. Don't do it to yourself. Don't do it. That's just like I ain't trying to see. You know, I ain't gonna lie. I, I'll look at it. You know, Clarissa Shields talking about a man of New Year's. She's calling that fight. And I know why Clarissa Shields is doing it because she's all about advocating for the money, advocating for women getting paid equal. I get it, man. But you in boxing. I get what you're trying to do. You seen Floyd do it with Conor McGregor. I get it, bro. But check this out. Conor McGregor was a two division champion. Floyd was a legend. TBE. He was just chilling. He felt the need to come out of hibernation. Of the ring. And say, you know what? Motherfuckers are really believing Conor McGregor can beat me. Okay. I'm all about getting a over 100 million. Sign the contract. He let Conor McGregor do some shit to him that nobody in boxing has ever did to Floyd Mayweather. Conor McGregor was damn disrespectful, tapping Floyd on the head. Floyd didn't fucking care. You know what Floyd was thinking about? He was like, I'm waiting on the check. Because I'm going to go in here and stop this motherfucker when I feel like it. And I'm going to collect my check. So you all continue to jump on social media thinking Conor McGregor, the notorious one, is going to come up here and be the first one to hand, handle, hand me my first loss. The naiveness of the people who actually believe that shit was going to happen. Now you have Carissa Shields somewhat trying to emulate the same thing. Check out the pattern, y'all. This is what I do. I cover boxing and MMA. Check out the pattern. Amanda Nunez has, has, has basically, she's considered the GOAT of mixed martial arts. She's a two-division champion. She's beat two of the best. Seriously. She beat Chris Cyborg. She's a current bantamweight and featherweight champion, 135, 145 pound division. Carissa Shears is trying to emulate exactly what happened between Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor was a two division champion. Carissa Shields is a unified champion in two divisions, undisputed in one. She has some stock. Her Wall Street is respectable for that fight to happen. Seriously. Carissa Shields is an absolute dog. Amanda Nunez is an absolute dog. The fight would make good for TV. But like I say, I do this too. How in the fuck is this fight going to happen 
when Carissa Shields is competing at 160. How is it going to happen if she's competing at 168? She's competing middleweight and super middleweight. How is that going to happen when the highest weight of Amanda Nunez was at 145? How is this going to happen? And she's really contemplating on going down to 154 to try to get a fight with Cecilia Brockes. You know how tough it's going to be for somebody who's holding muscle and holding weight like that? So you 10 pounds off the highest weight Amanda Nunez ever competed in. How in the hell this fight is going to happen? What weight class are you all going to contend at? You have to ask yourself that. How in the hell is this going to go down? What weight class? 154? A weight class that Amanda Nunez has never competed in? 135 is her division. She's a smaller fighter. Carissa Shield would be huge against Amanda Nunez. But one thing that separates the two, Carissa Shields is a two-time Olympian. She's a dog. Her, her boxing skill set is continuous. It's tenacious. Amanda Nunez, her freaking striking in MMA is multifaceted. Is tenacious, dogmatic, and she has knockout power. So when you factor in those two, if it's in a boxing ring, I just don't see how in no way, shape, or form, unless Carissa Shields get caught like she did against Hannah Gabriel coming in and get dropped. Because Amanda Nunez, in my opinion, even if she's lighter, she can drop Carissa Shields. She has more power than Carissa Shields. But when you're talking about in a boxing ring with the dog like Shields, it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a tough road. For real. It's gonna be a tough hill to climb for Amanda New Year's. Real talk. The whole rhythm, everything. You're talking about a two time Olympian. And for Amanda New Year's to even entertain this fight. Being that Carissa Shields fights at middleweight and super middle. I mean, who would do that? You really want to get a check to get your ass whooped? It's not going to happen. And y'all need to understand that. It's not going to happen. It's good for TV and shit, but it, it ain't going to happen. It's no sense in that. Anyway, moving on. Tank Davis, he fights in Baltimore, Maryland. You know, Tank Davis, man, um, you know, he's fighting a guy. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are talking about like shit, Tank. You know, when you gonna fight somebody that's that's well known, man. We 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 trying to wait to see Tank Davis step in there with somebody that's well known to unify or something. You know, that's what we want to see, Tank. It ain't like your fights at 21 and 0. It's not entertaining. You know, man, super featherweight champion. We got it. Would you fight in the guy, Ricardo um, Nunez? It's 21 and 2. People say, who is Ricardo Nunez? You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, Tank is ready to step up, in my opinion. He is. But um, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's just hard for me to. It's just hard for me to think that you know why Tank is fighting who he's he's fighting. You know what I'm saying? Why why not the big fights? I'm not sure, but we know Tank can bang. We know that shit. Carlos Nunez is ranked second in the WBA behind uh, Rene Alvarado. That's all. That's all we, we can say. You know, if you look to the left, the WBC, nothing. You look to the right for Ricardo Nunez and freaking the IBF, zilch. Look all the way to the right for the WBO, 
Ricardo Nunez, nada. Ricardo Nunez is ranked only in the WBA for this fight. You know what I'm saying? That's real talk. So anyway, moving on. I'm going to close this down. It's been a pleasure, y'all. I just wanted to go show um, some love to my man, Dada Chef, man. You know, one love to you and your family. They have a long, you know, next next two, three weeks ahead of them, man. Because I just think of all this funeral expenses. And I'm pretty sure they're taking care of all of that. You know, the promotion, hopefully. And like I said, like somebody said early on, you know, put up a fund, a GoFundMe or, or, or something. I don't know the, I don't know the, the, um, the protocol. You know, in these fighters that they pass in the ring. I mean, no one really knows like what their family benefits are if they if they die in the ring. We don't know the contractual details. But you know, I want to give, you know, a, a prayer and a salute, man, a big salute from World Combat Sports to Maxim Maxim Do, Do, Maxim Dollar Chef, 28-year-old fighter. He passed away, man. Salute. I really don't say rest in peace because you know, when you're dead and you're gone and you pass, your body always looked like it's in peace. I just never been a person to say rest in peace. I just say, you know, best wishes, you know, to you. Rest peacefully, man. For real. Um, Conroy said Loma will give Tank a beating. I'm going to get back to that comment right quick because I was about to close out there, Conroy. Conroy said, thanks for your time. Just subscribe. Uh, uh, Freddie, I appreciate that, Freddie. Um, Con Conroy, for your... Um, I, I, I like when people come in here and just, you know, say things like that. I, I'm not the one to sit up here and judge people just drop comments like that. As long as it's boxing orientated, it's cool, man. Say what the fuck you want. You know what I'm saying? As long as it ain't trolling, it's all good. But, but Lomachenko giving tank a beating the fight has to happen sometime soon tank is young in the game and he has plenty of time lomachenko doesn't one thing we totally understand that comroy is that the clock never stops the clock never fucking stops it never stops and lomachenko is getting older and older and older so when I when I see comments come on here to my Lomachenko give people beating in 2019, 2020, 2021, you have to sit up here and just relax a little bit. Just relax and see what you're talking about. How many amateur fights did Lomachenko have again? Come on now, you got you have access to a keyboard. How many? amateur fights so you combine your his amateur fights to the to the to the minimal weight of his professional deposit right now that people love to glorify you take that in combination and you pack on about another six years to his boxing career when it comes to his age okay when it comes to lomachenko age he's much older than his his appearance presents itself. So every year, people are going to continue to say Lomachenko, Lomachenko, Lomachenko is going to be killing motherfuckers that's young in the game, that's moving up, that can bang, all because he has good footwork and he's, he's, a, he's a pure athlete. Lomachenko is an astute athlete. The man has mad skills. Seriously. But Lomachenko, as we've seen him get exposed with Jorge Linares when he was sat down in the six, when he fought um, Jose Pedraza, who went the distance with him, he dropped him with a body shot. Okay. But he still went the distance with Lomachenko. So when Tank Davis get up here, Tank Davis has been boxing. Y'all need to do a little bit more research on, on Javante Tank Davis. He's been boxing for quite a time. Quite a long time, people. Tank Davis isn't a slouch. It don't matter how slow he talks and the way he acts, people. Tank Davis is no joke. He isn't. 
We're just waiting for him to step up and fight somebody that we can we can gloat over. We say, okay, Tank fighting this person. Okay, cool. You know, that's the only thing we're waiting for when it comes to Tank. Not Ricardo Nunez. We're waiting for him to step up and fight somebody that we can say, okay, he's 21 and 0. We was waiting on him to fight this person. You know what I'm saying? We was white. We, we was waiting on him to, to fight Miguel Burchett, Burchett, or Andrew um, Cancio, Tevin Farmer, Jamel Herring. We was waiting on him to fight those people. That's who we want to see Tank step up and fight. Somebody who's known, someone who we can we can sit up here and feel good about jumping on the mic and talking about his competition. Tank Davis can bang, man. But I don't think Lomachenko, with the way he continues to get older and older, you all are going to continue to jump on here and say he's going to beat the shit out of everybody that comes into the narrative of Lomachenko. You know what I'm saying? I'm just keeping it. I'm just keeping 100, Conroy. You know what I'm saying? You just can't continue to say Lomachenko is going to continue to flourish in the sport of boxing when he's getting older. No one told him to come into the to, to, to entry, make entry into the sport of boxing at, 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 at what he thought was the perfect time to for a heist to come in here and say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to earn a world championship in the shortest fights, period. And it didn't work out. Because whoever cho chose Salito, they fucked up. You know. So he took all that amateur experience, all that motherfucking amateur experience, and then try to slide into the professional ranks at the right time when certain people was maneuvering this, that, and the other, and then get, get a career started. I'm telling you, man, Lomachenko is not going to be able to keep up this momentum. You know, he already said he ain't moving up. You think Lomachenko's going to move up at 140? You think he's going to go get that Regis Pro Grade Ruga Ru work? Let me know what you're thinking, man. Because right now, I think, right now, Lomachenko has not unified the division yet. I'm talking about undisputed, right? So right now, having Teofimo Lopez and Richard Comey probably on a um, future projected date, we may have the, the winner of that face Lomachenko. So Lomachenko unified the goddamn lightweight division, potentially, okay? Will he step up to 140? And if he does step up to 140, you really think he wants Regis Prograce? You think he, he, he won't tall, lanky, rangy Maurice Hooker? Serious? I mean, Lomachenko might end his career as a three division champion, and then all he want to talk about is the Hall of Fame this and the Hall of Fame that. Lomachenko is gonna be in the Hall of Fame. It's no way he's gonna be pound for pound and glorified the way he is by everybody and not be in the Hall of Fame. They're gonna put his ass in the Hall of Fame. What he should be doing is trying to be great. We ain't talking about his Olympic status. We're talking about him, his professional boxing career. That's what I mean. Like, he should be trying to be great, man. He, he That's what he should be trying to do. Y'all agree? No? Y'all think Lomachenko's great? Hmm? 13 and 1, 10 knockouts. Do y'all think Lomachenko is great? Those of you that's the remaining in the building, just drop your comment. Okay. Conroy said he's great. Because I know, I know, I know Conroy is gonna say that because he, he came up with the comment that um he's gonna, you know, do that to my man Tank. Kevin Ford don't want Tank nowhere near him. He will beat him if they fight. Within the next three years, 100%, unless Tank gets lucky and gets a KO. I just need to see Tank step up and, and, and give somebody the work. Look at 
Listen to me now. The silly Lomachenkos. Let me start with the one and only fighter they love mentioning, undefeated Nicholas Waters. That's what they always, hey, Lomachenko ain't fight nobody. Yeah, he did. He fought Gary Russell Jr. Undefeated for the vacant WBO title. You know what I'm saying? Okay, Gary Russell fighting once a year. Very solid fighter. I got it, man. I understand that you want to put that up there. And Gary Russell was undefeated at the time they fought. But only the next one is Nicholas Waters, who was undefeated 26-0. Okay, kudos. Kudos. He didn't stop Gary Russell, but he ended up, you know, getting retired Nicholas Waters. Kudos. Okay, let's go up to Jason Sosa. Miguel Mariaga. Rigondeaux moved up two weight classes. And then the rest is what it is. Jorge Linares. Jose Pedraza, Anthony Crowler, which looked for a way out up against the ropes, which was a sorry bout. And now he has Luke Campbell across the pond. O2 Arena. 20 and 2. Luke Campbell. Is this record a great record? With Gary Russell Jr., Nicholas Waters, Jason Sosa, and then with all the other fighters that they want to put Rigondeaux, Linares, and Pedraza. Is that a great record? Y'all know how to put your comments. It's eight in the building, man. What y'all what y'all doing? It's eight in the building. It is eight in the building. Conroy is the only one that responded. You know what I'm saying? I never said he would outwork Lomachenko. I didn't say that, man. I said it would be a very good fight. Tank Davis can fight. And people need to understand that. You know, uh, Lomachenko is not going to walk over Tank Davis. One thing, you know, Lomachenko and his footwork and everything, he may frustrate Tank Davis because he's that guy. Lomachenko has incredible movement, has incredible coordination, has incredible um the way he put it, put his hands together, you know, put those combinations together and let his hands fly. You know, the, the way he put combinations together, he he is an athlete. Lomachenko can goddamn transition over the mixed martial arts if he wanted to, you know, if he worked on his ground game or whatever. Lomachenko is that guy that really kick ass outside the, the boxing ring, kick somebody in the head with a left, left or right high kick. He's that guy. Lomachenko is that guy that'll take you to the ground and sub you outside of the boxing ring. He's that dude. He's trained in other sports, other disciplines besides boxing. But in this sport with gloves on, I just don't see his records being great. But he is the pound for pound best right now for those who voted him in. And he's going to be a future Hall of Famer because everybody loves Lomachenko, man. That's in that that um a proven authority up top everybody's up there to love lomachenko no way that they want to move this man down from pound for pound they want him to stay above canelo they want him to stay up there as long as possible stay in front of um terence crawford all that but you know what we need to understand is what when is his when is he going to step up and fight somebody that really at this point in his career that we can say damn you know like that like manny pacquiao fought keith thurman are we gonna see that fight that we shake our head and say god damn lomachenko shit showed up i didn't see that coming i didn't see that shit coming right there but anyway people let me see any last words that i have to any last words that i want to um hold on for a second I'm about to close this shit out. I'm trying to look for one last layer. Um, I wanted to ask you all, and, I, and you know, just don't sit back and chill because I know some of you just sitting back, you know, not even not even tuned in as a boxing fan, just tuned in, period. But I wanted to ask you, did you do you all believe that Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao is a more sellable fight right now? 
Do you all believe that somehow, some way that him defeating Keith Thurman, and he has a belt that it's enough to urge TBE money Mayweather. Would you all want to see that fight for 95, 99 PPV being that Manny Pacquiao is somehow, somehow reinvigorated his stock and he doesn't he didn't look old do you believe that fight happened because Floyd is going to demand drug testing but with his performance over Keith Thurman do you all believe that the hype and the interest within the boxing communal will surge to request this fight yes or no just let me know and then I'm out I just want to see three or four responses on what do you think Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao will happen. That's all I need to know. And why y'all thinking about that? Tell me, they talking about Canelo and Darian Chico deal in the works. IBF purse bid. Who wants to see Canelo and Darian Chinko when Canelo has already faced Daniel Jacobs, who defeated Darian Chinko? Why would Canelo want to fight a f the leftovers of Daniel Jacobs? Why? Oh, my God, man. I'm looking forward to that Maurice Hooker, Jose Marie Ramirez fight, though, the WBC champion. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that fight right there. And then to close this out, Amir Khan, stop faking the funk. Amir Khan, go over here and, and stop dibs. And then talk about him and him and Manny Pacquiao is already signed. Why would Manny Pacquiao want to face Amir Khan? What you need to do is go back in there with Terrence Crawford and convince us that when you step up in competition, you won't sit up there and quit. I was there in the building. You quit, Amir Khan. You quit. You quit. You wouldn't even turn around and face and look Terrence Crawford in the face when he was in the middle of the ring. You just sat there and act like, oh, my God, man, he hit me in the balls. He hit me in the balls. No, he didn't. He hit you on the thigh, bro. And he was working you. He was turning the volume up on you, Amir Khan. Conroy, I agree. You know, it, it depends. I, I agree in certain aspects about uh, Tank not working, outworking Lomo. But, but um, you know, it, hey, Lomachenko is an athlete, for real. I, I, I haven't really did a whole lot on Lomachenko. I just thought as a fighter, his competition level, he was a bit overrated to me. That's just my opinion. Uh, I felt the same way about Triple G. Triple G has since fallen off when he stepped up in competition. Um, you know, it is what it is. People are going to say what they say, but what I will give Lomachenko, his athleticism and his unbelievable skill set all around from any angle, footwork, fluid, fluidity. I mean, it's amazing to watch. It's beautiful to watch the sweet signs. His dad putting him in a dance class. Hey, kudos to you, sir. <laughs> um, come Roy, stop it. L Lowball wants to fight. Okay, look, listen. Right now, Artem Lowball is going to get what he want. Um, he was he, he was whooping con and just tried to play the shit off like he got clipped in the nuts. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. But back to my boy Artem Lowball. Listen. It's fucked up, right? That as as a fighter, I didn't support too much in Conor McGregor. I just thought he was all hype and he needed to work on his ground game, right? And he was just all about that counter. You know, Conor McGregor has this style where he want to measure you and then try to land his power shot. I mean, I get it. I get what Conor McGregor 
style is. And it worked against Jose Aldo, who rushed in on him. And they both landed at the same time. Um, but I never really was Conor McGregor fan. But I, I do like Artem Lobov. Seriously, I like I like the guy, even though his arms are short as I don't know what. And every time Keith Thurman was, <laughs> I see him up there imitating the T-Rex with Manny Pacquiao. <laughs> Manny Pacquiao looking at this motherfucker like, okay, I got something for you later. Okay, you keep talking. Keep talking, Thurman. And um, Keith Thurman's up there imitating T-Rex. It's funny as shit. But Arden Lobov is a good dude, man. Seriously. Shout out to, to the hammer. The Russian hammer, Artem Lobov, man. You know, I end up meeting him in bare knuckle fight, man. Good dude. For real. Artem Lobov is a good dude, man. I understand totally why he wasn't taking that shit off Pauly. I understand this dude is a ride or die dude. You know, he's been knowing Conor McGregor for quite some time. This dude is a, is a good guy, man. He's a tough motherfucker, dog. He is. Now, granted, he's not one of the special fighters that I'm I'm looking forward to, to see on PPV. Or I'm saying, oh man, I can't wait to see. Um, you know, he lacks a lot of a lot of um he's he lacks a lot of um advanced like dangerousness, severity to his skill set. Like he really needs to polish up a lot when it comes to his head movement, his boxing skills setting up his combinations he really need to you know he's a mixed martial artist but now he's in bare knuckle fighting in order for him not to take as much punishment as he did against jason knight he really needs to goddamn work on head movement lateral movement footwork but as far as his heart goes any day i'll take Arden Lobe off the war i'll take him to war i'll take him to battle i'll take him because i know he's going to be like tell me where they're at tell me where they're at Let's go. Let's go. You you heard of the shield? Arden Lobov is the shield. He is. He's that dude. He'll go to tyranny. He ain't taking no shit off nobody. That's Arden Lobov, man. Salute to him. Real talk. Real talk. It's just, you know, Conor McGregor, man. It's just a lot when it comes to the game of mixed martial arts. He is a future Hall of Famer because he, he was able to be the first to be a two-division champion. Okay? But he had losses coming into the UFC. And to see him go over there and get subbed out by Diaz, I saw that shit coming. I knew he didn't have cardio. And when he shot in, he got subbed out almost goddamn instantaneously. And to see him go in there and get Khabib to make a med off, there was some good highlights. But Khabib just outworked him. And once again, he was subbed out. Once again, he was subbed the fuck out. Conor McGregor boxed as an amateur, but he really needs to spend a lot of time on the ground. And even if he did spend a lot of time on the ground, he needs more than two years to match the Sumbo expertise of the champion himself and could beat the Mega Medal. Period. Period. But one thing I can say about Conor McGregor, he has a win over Dustin Poirier, who's about to step in there with Khabib. He defeated Dustin back in the day. He did. He defeated Max Holloway, too. He did, man. But right now, Dustin Poirier is about to step in there for the toughest challenge of his life. He has pretty decent boxing skills. He is a good guy, a respectable fighter. You know, none, no nonsense. Get straight to the point. But I do believe Khabib has enough when it comes to taking, um, you know, his 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 takedown ability, going in for the shot, ground control, whether it's in half guard, whatever. If he gets him in half guard, Dustin better hope he don't try to gift wrap. Khabib don't try to gift wrap him, and then or put him in a crucifix. And do his patented ground and pound. He better be ready to, to, to make it back up to his feet. Because when, when Khabib scoops, scoop those legs together and have him sitting out, 
Dustin's going to have to have an answer for that because he, he did that with Conor McGregor with ease. When he scooped the legs, he does that shit like breathing naturally. Um, Conrad said, I want to see Nate versus Khabib. No, bro. Hell no, Conrad. For what? He will freaking blitz Nate Diaz. Even though Nate Diaz's jujitsu game is high level, so is Khabib's Sambo game. And right now, with the striking, Nate's take too much punishment, man. If you look at his face when he fought freaking Conor McGregor and his and, and Conor McGregor's um and Khabib's face when he fought Conor McGregor, two different freaking masks that we're looking at. It's, it's going to be hard to get Khabib in the triangle, man, because of his when, when his top pressure, once he gets the fighter on the back, his top pressure is just respectable on all levels. He never places himself in a predicament for the for the legs, the long legs of Nate Diaz um, to get him in a triangle that easy. He's always working to pass the guard. Always working for side control. And then you let him hurry up and put you, in, you know, incapacitate, put you in a crucifix and start raining down punches. Or, or, or even full mount. It's a beast to get from underneath Khabib the Mega Man off. It's a beast. His top game is crazy. His pressure is respectable. Yeah, Diaz has mad scar tissue, man. He's been in some wars, man. You know, right now, though, unless Diaz, Nate Diaz coming in, I'm talking about your, your coming up up, to, up top. Um, Diaz will be Connor again. I'm just looking at Diaz being out of the game for a while. You know what I'm saying? I'm just looking at Connor being in there with Khabib. Shaking off the rust, being in there with a tough opponent. I don't see anything. I, I see Connor having an edge like he did in the rematch. For real. I for real. I see Connor Connor defeated Diaz in the rematch, and I see him doing the same thing if they was to fight again. Diaz takes too much punishment. They have they had some of the best hands in the game. But the sport has evolved to a point of, you know, defense or going in for a shot, whatever the case may be. Like the sport is continuing to evolve and all that slap boxing and, and and shit that's straight up and down striking. It's just so much. It's so many setups to the takedown. It's just too many. Look at Henry Cejudo, gold medal wrestler. He's evolved his hands to the point where, man, he's able to throw some punches at awkward positions. And before you know it, he's in for a, a double leg. He's in on the clinch. He's in on them hips. He's scooping, taking you for a ride. I mean, that you, we're talking about a gold medal wrestler who ended up defeating one of the best mixed martial artists of this era in Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. We're talking about a man who faced considerably the best bantamweight weight there was in TJ Dillashaw, and he knocked him out in the first round in 40-some seconds, right? I mean, come on, man. The game is forever evolving. And one thing that has to do with that is the hands, the boxing, the setups. You know, you really got to be very wary of someone throwing a punch, going in for a takedown, or throwing a kick, whatever the combination is, you know, are they really trying to throw a punch for damage just to get in close, land in the knee? You know, we just saw what happened to George Masvidal when he sat up there and put his hands behind his back and started walking and then went into a sprint for the natural reaction of Ben Askren to duck his head and try to go for a double leg and ran right into a knee. That's called studying film. That's called being smart. Um, Converse, I think Diaz won that fight. Hey, everybody assesses things different. I, I, I thought Connor did. You know, it could have went either way, man. It's, it's like that Canelo and Triple G shit.
the first one that they had. People thought it went either way, you know. It's just like the um, Castillo fight versus Mayweather. People, <laughs> one of them, they thought it went one way, you know what I'm saying? And then other people think it went the other way. Freddie said, I took my headphones out a little while ago when you said you were signing off. Just know that you're still on. Love the passion. Yeah, I mean, I when people want to start talking about freaking cross thread and disciplines from boxing to MMA and all that, I don't mind entertaining the shit. Because it's good, it's good, it's good for um, you know, it's good media, man. I, I like talking about different sports. You know, if people want to start talking about grappling, it just what it does for me, it allows me to basically let people know how how much depth that I have for the knowledge of the sport. There are levels, you know, that's why I remain quiet when you know you have so many people out here that say they're the best at this knowledge game and all this it's no best really it's no best like the, the shit is so fucking deep you know what i'm saying the the levels are so deep like what are you the best at are you the best at just talking boxing are you the best at talking boxing and mma or, or boxing mma freaking grappling boxing mma grappling muay thai had on taekwondo are you talking about kempo are you talking about gi no gi jiu-jitsu tournaments grappling are we talking about which which freaking organization of grappling i mean what are we talking about are we talking about k1 kickboxing it's just so many levels to the knowledge it's just too many levels man so when people start to cross thread disciplines and talk I'm all for it. I'm like, shit. Talk about talk about some mixed martial arts, man. Talk about shit that's popping off in boxing and all these other sports, man. Good shit. Yeah, come on, say levels beyond levels, man. That's what I'm saying. It's levels, man. I just laugh at people who believe that, you know, if you know boxing. And that's what you know. Cool. Kudos to you. But there's too many people out here saying, okay, boxing, ain't nobody out here better than me. It is, man. It is. It's people out here that know certain things about boxing. I feel that to know more than one discipline in anything you do in life, to know more than one thing says you, has, you have more knowledge than a person that knows just one. Period. I mean, if a person just knows a plethora of one particular subject, then someone who knows various, then what is that saying? There's too many levels to the shit, man. Conroy say Masvidal has been around a long time. Glad he's shining. Masvidal has to, has to just stay on top right now. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you like like now, you know, him and Leon that was have a history. He gave him the three piece with a soda. He should have been talking that shit to a street guy like Masvidal. Seriously, he shouldn't be talking that shit to a street dude like Masvidal. We're talking about a dude who who's pulling up in backyards, fighting on the street. They got a different mentality to walk up to you and and give you a three punch combination in the face after he just finished fighting. That's naive of Leon Edwards just to think that just because you're in a combat sport, you can talk some shit to everybody. Not Masvidal, you can't. George is cut from a different cloth, man. He's cut from a different cloth. And the way Leon Edwards looked this past fight, man, come on, man. You know, like, look, I, I assess shit. I try to dichotomize it, right? As unbiased as I possibly can. You know, when I saw Masvidal in there with Darren Till, I was like, shit, he got dropped, you know, but he still was able to get up and um, land some nice combinations. And he was thinking in there how to close distance. And the whole time I kind of see, I kind of seen him emulating what, what, what um, Tyrone Woolley was doing, blitzing. You know, he was blitzing and letting his hands go. And Darren Till has a bad problem. He has, he has a, I mean, I'm talking about, he has a bad habit of just going straight back lineal. 
when someone is blitzing him from the front and he get caught on the chin and fucking dropped. So when I saw Hor George Masvidal, you know, getting dropped in there with Darren Till, I said, okay, he's going to have to make changes not to stand in there with the with a big fighter and a heavy-handed guy like Till if you give him the opportunity. But he survived. He knocked him out. I said, you knocked out somebody who Tyrone knocked out. So be it. It was just, you know, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson was just too scared to let his hands fly and use all that damn years and years of freaking martial arts of his to take risk. He took risks against Tyron Woolley, but he wouldn't do it against Darren Till, who has somewhat of a similar um, fighting style that he, that he had. It's crazy. It's weird. Tyron Woolley had him in a deep guillotine, and he got out of it. How the fuck you going to sit there for that amount of time and let Darren Till just damn milk you and milk you and control the, control the aggression? So anyway, George Masvidal against Leon Edwards. I don't want to see that fight right now. I'd rather see him step in there with, you know, a title contention of the winner. You know, whoever's next. You know, I would definitely like to see that. I wouldn't mind seeing him going in there against Kobe Coverton. Um, Kobe Coverton is a is a damn good wrestler. Fuck all the big mouth shit, talking shit. Kobe can wrestle. But like I said, in, in his fight, he took a lot of punishment from Damian Maya. Damian Maya, the, 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 the two-time jiu-jitsu world champion, I'm like, well, how can Damian Maya, who really doesn't have that good of hands, do that much punishment to you, Kobe? You know what I'm saying? So you took that much punishment against a person who's a jiu-jitsu practitioner. But you want to go in here against Kamar Usman, who just totally manhandled to a point. He easily progressed through the match against Tyron Woodley, who's a pretty decent wrestler. You got to figure that shit out. Kamar Usman, he took his, he got his chance. He got his shot and he sees that shit. He's going to be tough. I would definitely like to see him in there again, Kobe Covington. For real. I would like to see him in there against George Masvidal, Kobe Covington. Or see George Masvidal go in there against Kamar Usman. Freddie, I tell my kids all the time, know a little about a lot rather than a lot about a little bit. Real talk, man. Real talk, Freddie, for real. As I just sit back out here, man, I just sit back. You know, the media game, you know, you have you have so many people that they call a debate, arguing back and forth and cutting you off. You know what I'm saying? That's what they call a debate. Some of these people want to have a debate, but all they want to do is yell and scream and start talking about personal shit. And then before you know it, it's fuck this, fuck that, nigga this, nigga that. That's not a debate. That's you getting mad and off-topic conversations about the sport. People want you to listen. Some of these people want you to listen to them talk about knowledge all the time, you know, and, and some people are very knowledgeable in the sport, hands down, period. But some of them, they just want you to listen and listen and listen, but they just can't do the same. If boxing is all you're talking about, so be it. But don't say you're the best. There's too many people out here that's been following the sport for quite some time to say you're the absolute best. Who proves that? Unless you're on TV in a spelling bee, like they do a spelling bee, and they're asking random boxing questions. Are they asking boxing mixed with MMA? Are they um, asking multiple questions and different threads of disciplines on TV? And they have the best of the best in the world. That is the only way you can prove that you're the top notch and you're the grand pooba of this combat sports game. Besides that, all it is is just gibberish. It's just bravado, ego, 
and it's and it sounds good for the mic but I always have a hashtag no keyboard and we're going to talk about the sport let's talk about it outside of the keyboard and let's keep it strictly on the topic of discussions that we're talking not freaking the debate where you want to cut somebody off all the time and start down dropping obscenities and vulgarity and we're really not talking about the sport but it's just the argument you know that's my only that's that's my only odds with really you know composing and staying back the way i do i'm not staying back because i have any fear or anything i just know my level of knowledge and i'm a listener i like observing i don't look for people to give me the credit for anything But in this media game, it's just so many people that feel that they need to continue to um, emphasize to the viewing and listening public that there ain't nobody out here doing it the way they're doing it. And I would give the ones that know the shit, I would give them all the credit in the world, man. You know your shit. You know your shit for real. But don't get it misinterpreted that i'm saying you know more than me or i'm saying i know more than you that's all i'm saying man it's just simple it's, it's just, just simple i'm not asking people to give freaking you know go up here and say well um i need for you to give me some credit The real ones don't ask for credit. They just know what they have and they keep it. They keep it in the cash. That's all it needs. But anyway, back to combat sports. I think that's all. Unless y'all have them. See, I don't know who's going to win with Lawler and Covington. I, hey, I'll tell you who's who going to win that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Robbie Lawler has been into to some motherfucking battles. You know that, Conroy. And, and it was a point in time where I, 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 I know the old Robbie Lawler. The one that used to just lose control and let his hands go and just put everything in the kitchen sink. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, he wasn't all about the kicks. Um, his takedown defense wasn't that good. And you know, if you if you really frustrate Lawler and land some punches on him, he'd just lose control and just go for broke. That has since changed. You know what I'm saying? I was glad to see him go in there and beat boring ass Johnny Hendricks. Real talk. I loved it. But going in there against Kobe Covington, the one thing I will like I will say that that that's a that's um advantage for either fighter. I think Robbie Lawler has better hands than Covington, and of course Covington has better wrestling than Robbie Lawler. Period. Kobe wrestling should be respected. He still needs to work on his hands to me, but his 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 wrestling is respected. Robbie Lawler, I, I truly believe he's been in the sport. His stay is, is Hall of Fame. Um, he needs to go. He's taken a lot of punishment, and you can tell when he's giving interviews sometimes. It just seems like his speech is a little slurred. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, he's been in some wars, man, especially the war he had with Roy McDonald. So I just think, oh, oh you know, my man, Robbie Lawler, should just look to hang it up man just chill bro you don't need to prove anything else robbie you don't need to prove nothing else to nobody but i think kobe is gonna try to take robbie lawler down and punish him he's gonna continue to try to get um, um collapse the pocket get in close so he can lock up and take him down and you know earn rounds that way it's only going to be three rounds so if i'm if i'm if i'm looking at kobe covington he's gonna try to take him down and man and, and and land some punches on robbie you know robbie's been knocked out you know if you would have if you hey conroy you would have put this up in the mma site and you say okay lawler's gonna go in there and knock out covington Covington don't have a, um, a chance. Those casual, some of these casual MMA fans that love kicking people out the group, they actually, 
know about the sport. They'll say, how the fuck you think that's going to happen? There's no way that's going to happen. Covington can't beat Robbie Lawler, but they don't think about how many times Robbie Lawler's been in trouble. They don't think about how Tyron Woodley smashed him in one round. You know, they don't think about the wars that Robbie Lawler has been in. That neurologically, he may be facing a bit more than what people can see on the outside. And Kobe Covington, he's pretty healthy right now. You know, he, 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 he's, he's at a point in, I think, his competitive edge right now. He'll be able to go in there and defeat Robbie. I don't, I don't foresee it being an early knockout, but I do, I do um, see it as being a unanimous decision. I just truly think Kobe is too much for Robbie at this point. See, you look at what Ben Askren did. Ben Askren is predictable. He got tossed up by Robbie Lawler and dumped on his head because Robbie's been in the game, man. He's been in the game for quite some time. He know what the fuck was going on when he fought Ben Askren. But I just, I'm not sure what's going on with him to just stall out and get put in a bulldog choke the way he did and not try to move and advance the position. Try to work to, you know, some um, to work the hands, try to do something. Like he had him in a bulldog choke. Unless try to get yourself to the point where you can grab hold of Ben Askren, not just there on all fours, man. And letting this motherfucker choke you like that. And a bulldog choke is not something that's that's used all the time in the sport of mixed martial arts. It's only so many people who's who's, who's basically been a, been able to apply a bulldog choke. I think Ronda Rousey um did it once. Who else did a bulldog choke? Um it was somebody else that did a bulldog choke in lighter weight class, too. I mean, that that doesn't happen. Oh, Jason Knight did a freaking bulldog choke, I believe. That particular submission don't happen all the time. And, and for it to happen to a veteran like Robbie Lawler, man, it's just a little bit crazy that, you know, Robbie Lawler might be thinking a little bit slower than we, you know, the casuals see, see it, you know? Um, if Lawler lose this or if even wins, he should end it. Yeah, he should, man. He should. I think Robbie Lawler should be out the game already. He, he has nothing that he needs to show and prove to nobody. I'm glad he was able to finally pick up the championship. I'm glad he didn't let Johnny Hendricks stall him out. I love the fact that he was able to take the you know, get that championship because Johnny Henry is one of the worst, one of the most boringest champions that was in mass. Well, I'm glad that dude lost the title. And he's out. He was just that laying and praying shit. They think of Johnny Hendricks. Real, real talk. They think of Johnny Hendricks. One of the most boring is mixed martial arts, man. This out there. Chris Cyborg is coming back to 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 face you know one of the most hillbilly man i don't know i don't know why they're doing a rematch i guess because she gave cyborg a little test and run for her money whatever but nelson is coming back to fight C cyborg i truly don't know what they want to happen i guess because she got knocked out by amanda new year's they trying to think that the most competitive um, opponent for her to come back and fight would be Nelson. I forgot her first name, but whenever you get a female that that, that wears freaking jeans with, with a goddamn plaid shirt with steel toe boots, you know you in goddamn trouble. She tell you to have your ass home at eight o'clock. You better be there at seven twenty six on the nose. I'm trying to find out what's this female name. Spencer. No, I'll take that back. She's fighting Spencer. Why the hell is she fighting Spencer? What the? Spencer is 7-0. Oh. 
Big girl, I guess they need somebody to fight that weight class, somebody around that weight. Okay, I got it. I thought it was the other chick, but she's fighting Spencer. All right. Spencer's Spencer's pretty tough. When she fought Megan Anderson, she put hands on her. She punished her. All right, got it. I'm not looking forward to it, but I got it. Somebody just said that I'm so upset right now. I'm talking to my bro, Monty Barrett. Dada Chef is going home to his family. Who knows if he has insurance? Boxing is so greedy. Nothing set to the side in case something like this happens. Heck yeah, he's going home to his family, man, because they want him to be buried there. Yes, it is messed up. Um, so she was with Tyson yesterday at the ranch. I got to see what she was saying. Okay. But everybody, that's it for me, man. It's been a pleasure as always, man, dealing with the fight fans, the fanatics, the aficionados. It's always a pleasure tuning in. You know, today, once again, salute to, to Dada Chef. Hope for everything work out with him and his family and the trainer, Hall of Fame, Buddy McGirt. Don't feel guilty about anything you did, what you had to do, my man. You know, continue to grind out there in the sport of boxing. You know, people ain't going to never be satisfied. Be sure to follow me on Facebook, IG, Twitter, and pass the word about subscribing. Man. I'm trying to get up to 10,000, 20,000 subscribers, man. You know what I'm saying? Support World Combat Sports. Um, I'm not sure it's the next, next LZ. LZ in military terms is landing zone for media. I'm not sure when the next landing zone for me to attend the fight, but I'll be sure to put it out here in social media and let y'all know. But um, yeah, man, um, hit the bell icon, man, so you can get notifications when I go live on here. Um, a lot of the times <clears throat> I don't go live on a weekly basis. I mean, not a weekly basis, a daily basis. Because I do other things too. <clears throat> but be sure to um, check out my website, worldcombatsports.com. I put that down there. World. Yeah, check out the website, worldcombatsports.com, man. You know, I got some articles out there that I wrote. Um, some media vids I put up. Stuff like that. I do this all on my own, man. So every time I get support, I appreciate y'all looking out and understanding the hard work. That's what it's about. And be sure to turn up and tune in to World Combat Sports. I'm out.